Okay, Mr. Marshall, you are a co-host. We are recording. The attendees have come on in and it's 6.30. We're good to go. All right. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of March 16th, 2022. My name is Doug Marshall and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.31 p.m. The meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is available on the meeting agenda posted on the town's website's calendar listing for this meeting or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the Town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll, a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively and place yourselves back on mute. Maria Chow. Present. Uh, Jack Jemsek. Present. Tom Long. Present. Andrew McDougall. Present. I, Doug Marshall, am present. Janet McGowan. Present. And Johanna Newman. Present. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause temporarily to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your raised hand and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. The general public comment item is it reserved for public comment regarding items that are not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment may also be heard at other times during the meeting when determined appropriate. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, Please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participate, participation will be disconnected from the meeting. All right, so the first item on our agenda this evening are, is a review and approval, hopefully, of minutes. Uh, we, I believe we have two minutes available for uh, action this evening. The first from uh, November 3rd of last year. Uh, th this was in our packet last week, or last, at our last meeting, and uh, I think it showed up a little bit late and short before the meeting, so we decided to postpone it until this meeting. So uh, I hope that everybody's had a chance and taken advantage of the opportunity to read it. Um, would anybody like to make a motion to approve it? Uh, and then we can have some discussion. Andrew. I'll make a motion to approve. Thank you. Uh, anybody want a second? Johanna, I see your hand. Thank you all second. Okay, great. Is there any discussion of those minutes uh, from November 3rd? Um, they had a number of uh, changes tracked uh, on the copy I at least received. And um, 
they show the enhancements that Chris went through and did based on a, a, a list, an, an additional listening to the recording, I believe. Um, I think that was in response to some board comments that, that they weren't adequately detailed. <clears throat> so does anyone have any comments about these minutes other than that I appreciate uh, the time and effort that Chris spent to revise these? No comments. All right. Chris, it sounds like you've done your job. All right. Uh, so no, no conversation. We have a motion and a second. Uh, why don't we just go through and, and have a roll call vote? Um, starting with Maria. Proof. And Jack. Proof. Tom. Approved. Andrew. Aye. Uh, Janet. Aye. Johanna. I have a question. I wasn't at this meeting and I think I can still approve it if the minutes look correct to me or I have the option to abstain as well. Is that accurate, Chris? That is accurate, yes. Okay, then I will approve these minutes as well, aye. Okay, and I'm an aye as well, so it's unanimous. Uh, the minutes from November 3rd are approved. All right, the second set of minutes is from our last meeting on March 2nd of 2022. Um, why don't we do the same order this time? Would anybody like to make a motion to have those approved? So nobody's putting their hand up. So I will make a motion to approve the minutes of March 2nd, 2022. Andrew, your hand is up. I'll second. All right. Thank you, Andrew. Anybody want to uh, have some discussion of these minutes? Tom, I see your hand. Thanks. So I submitted a comment to Chris um, about one of my comments that's on page eight. Um, usually I'm not a stickler about these things, but it's I want it to be represented correctly when these go out. Um, the comment was in regard to uh, support of um, incentives for solar development. And I believe someone raised the issue of incentives and I my comment was actually uh, against um, the use of solar incentives as opposed to encouraging solar um, incentives. So um, I wrote a short sentence that I sent to Chris and um, something that um, I'd like to change my statement to. Um, Mr. Long does not generally support solar incentives and cautioned that incentives can exacerbate inequities given that the cost even with incentives makes it inaccessible to many members of our community, which I believe if you guys can help me that that is my position as stated in our meeting. Okay. When did you send that to me? Um, Tom? Today, today, Chris, I didn't get to read these until this morning. So I, I sent it today. This morning, All right. Did you send a copy to Pam? I did and I can forward that to Pam now. Perfect. All right, um, so board members, uh, we have a request to amend the minutes. Uh, does anybody object to this amendment? Mm -hmm. All right, so, and um, I guess since I made the motion, I would accept that amendment as a friendly amendment. Um, I don't know who the parliamentarian among us is. Andrew. I was going to just say I would second the tweet amendment. Okay. Or, um, yes. Okay. So, uh, Chris, do we have to have a vote to accept the amendment and then vote on the minutes, or can we just go straight to the minutes as amended? You can go straight to the minutes as amended. Okay. Why don't we do that? So, uh, first of all, I'll just ask did anybody else have any comments on these minutes? No. Okay. I don't see any. Any comments? Um, so, so we'll go to a roll call vote to approve the March 2nd minutes with the uh, edit or the amendment that uh, Tom sent and read aloud in this meeting. Um, why don't we go backwards? We'll start with Johanna. Getting sneaky, Doug. I got you off guard. <laughs> 
Hi, okay, Janet. Hi. All right, uh, Andrew. Hi. And Tom. Hi. Jack. Approve. Maria. Approve. And I'm an approve. So um, <clears throat> unanimous approval with the one amendment. All right, so the time is 640. We have completed item one of our agenda. And we'll go to item two, which is public comment period. I see that we have 10 attendees. All right, so this at, attendees, this is the time for you to make public comment on items which are not on our agenda. So um, I don't know if you all are familiar with what's on our agenda. We're gonna discuss uh, a project at 164 or 174 Sunset Avenue. Uh, FEMA flood insurance, uh, fees for public hearing, legal ads, and the, the bids rapid recovery plan. So comments on any of those topics should be held until we get to those uh, topics in the meeting. Otherwise, if anyone has anything else they want to comment on, this is the time to do it. Okay, I don't see any hands raised among the attendees. Um, so we will move, move on. Uh, item three on the agenda is the uh, concerns or review and recommendation to the ZBA of 164, 174 Sunset Avenue uh, on behalf of Fearing Sunset LLC. And uh, we will have a presentation by attorney Tom Reedy a uh, familiar face, and at least in a little tiny square. <laughs> and um, I guess, uh, Chris, is there anything you want to say at the beginning, or should we turn it right over to Tom? I, I guess I, I want to just make sure we're all clear. Um, this is not a public hearing. And our role this evening is to discuss the project and and probably the comments we make may be transmitted to ZBA for their consideration when they do the uh, regulatory review of this project. Is that correct, Chris? That's correct. I would write a letter. Um, and if you had any specific recommendations or if you wanted the ZBA to consider certain conditions, um, I would include those in the letter and send it to um, the chair of the ZBA and Maureen Pollock, who's the staff of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Okay. Uh, with that, I guess, Tom, why don't you take it away? Perfect. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, Pam, could you, Jonathan Salvon should be in the audience. If you want to make him a panelist too, he'll be doing part of the presentation. Uh, for the record, record, thank you. For the record, Tom Reedy, attorney with Bacon Wilson um, and Amherst here on behalf of Fearing Sunset uh, for the project at 164, 174 Sunset Ave uh, at the corner of Fearing and Sunset. Um, right by the, the UMass dormitories, uh, the towers uh, in Amherst. With me this evening, Barry Roberts from Fearing Sunset, and I've got Jonathan Salvon from Cunard Girl Architects, who I think has done a really remarkable job designing this site. <clears throat> um, I've got some screens to share so that hopefully folks had the opportunity to look at some of the material that was provided. You know, We have, just for a little bit of background, uh, we started this project at least conceived of this project maybe a year or so ago, uh, went through many design iterations uh, to try to figure out what the best um, what, what the best design would be. Is it is it one big apartment building? Is it multiple smaller buildings? Are there townhouses? And so our initial submission was a 17 unit townhouse submission with a row of townhouses in the back of the parking and a row of townhouses along Sunset Ave. Because this is in the um, local historic district, we had to go to the local historic district commission to receive their approval um, to do what it is that we're ultimately looking to do, which Mr. Chairman, as you know, it's a zoning board of appeals special permit for these uses, which, which are allowed on, on these lots. So we started that process with the local historic district commission, I wanna say in August or September of last year, 
uh, got some really good feedback and uh, redesigned the project, frankly, uh, to eliminate those long rows of townhouses to what you'll see momentarily, um, which I think fits into the neighborhood a lot better. Jonathan can likely talk about the, the length of the buildings, the materials of the buildings and how we believe they do fit into the, the vernacular of the neighborhood. And so we did receive a certificate of appropriateness from the local historic district commission. And so our next stop formally is with the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, we've had discussions already with Fire Department, Mike Roy, Jason Skills, Town Engineer, Guilford Mooring, I mean, Superintendent of the Department of Public Works. We Barry's talked to Bill Laramie over at the Crime Prevention through Environmental Design. We've had some feedback from them. Um, so the, the design you'll see today is, is pretty baked. I mean, it's something that we've thought about and we've talked to different folks in town uh, to get to the place where we are today. So, you know, without much further ado, why don't I? And I'm just, if everybody can see my screen, you should have just a, a PowerPoint with a, a title screen. Um, and Pam, I can send this to you after. It's a pretty large file, but I can send it to you. I'll send you the Dropbox link. Thank so, you. Sunset 164, 174 Sunset Ave. Just to orient everyone, 174 is the yellow highlighted, 164 sunset is the blue. You see UMass campus here, football stadium here. You've got um, Kendrick Park, the uh, Amherst College football field and downtown is right here, just to give you a sense of context. And then just a close up of what we're talking about, Creamery building over here. Uh, this is, I believe a five unit condominium um, and then you've got single family homes on relatively smaller lots and it's a dense area. And then you've got the university uh, just to the north. And then just some on the ground context photos, if you will. So this is at the, the intersection of Fearing and Sunset. This is looking in a southwesterly direction. You've got 174 and 164. You can see in the back, if you've driven by the site, it's a big open field. Um, further back in the in the woodlands, there seems to be a lot of invasive species. There are no wetlands on the site, um, no wetlands proximate to the site. So we've had a wetland scientist go out already uh, and provide a letter to the Amherst Conservation Commission and Erin, suggesting that you know nothing more would be needed. And she accepted that she had been out there, or at least had done the desktop review as well. And then this is. Uh, with your back to the north, looking south down sunset, you've got the creamery building on the left and then where the you know proposed redevelopment is going to be on the right. This is looking northwest. So this is looking at 174. You see the towers in the background. The creamery is over to the right of the screen. This is taking that same position and just pivoting and looking to the southwest. You've got 164. This is a um, not owner occupied rental as well. Interestingly, there's like a, there's a strip of land between this property with the yellow house and this property with the white house that is, I want to say maybe five to eight feet wide that is owned by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And it extends because the land, if I go maybe here, the land behind this property is all owned by the Commonwealth, as you know the land slopes off and ultimately meets up with, I think it's North University Drive over there. And so this is just a little further to the south looking Northwest, you've got 164 and 174, and then you've got the towers in the background. Most of it is cleared. There's some vegetation towards the back. There are a couple of shade trees and we're working our way through the public shade tree uh, committee and, and working with Alan Snow, the tree warden. Part of what we had represented to the local historic district commission and which still holds true and will ultimately be submitting for um, a demolition permit in so far as we're looking to take down this garage and this breezeway and on let me see if i can find it over here this garage and then there is a uh, porch on the back we would be looking to take those down or, or off um, and then looking to relocate these houses. You, you may remember Barry had moved an Amherst College house from South Pleasant Street. Its new location is now at the corner of Snell and Baker Street. And so Barry would be using the same 
uh, building movers to move these houses. We haven't settled on a location yet. Um, we've got a couple in mind. Once those become final, then we'll, we'll let the public know because there's a lot of coordination that has to happen um, with the utilities, with the police, if we're traveling on any state roads, you know, with the uh, state police, mass DOT, et cetera. So um, we haven't finalized those yet, but we expect one to hopefully be in Amherst and one to be in Hadley. Um, so we're trying to save uh, those houses. They're, they're, I think one's from 1920, one's probably from 1940. The, the older one is this yellow one. And I think this is the I'll call it a newer one. Um, I think in the in the 1940s. So, and then we've got the proposed project. So what you saw was what exists, and here is what we're proposing. So we've got um, essentially three different building types that I think Jonathan will be able to talk about. The proposal is for uh, 17 residential units, of which two of those will be affordable. And the way Barry likes to work is, you know, you're allowed 30% of 80%. He likes to go lower than that, um, typically following the, what's called the voucher program. And I'm sure, I know I saw Nate Malloy was on, he could probably speak more in, intelligently than I could, but it's below the, the maximum of what he, Barry could do as far as rents go. And so, you know, I don't know if it's 70%, it's probably between 60 and 70%. If, if the board's really interested, we could let you know, but it is below the 80% and there would be two of those. And so, you know, the design really tries to do a couple of things. Um, it uses an existing curb cut over on Fearing Street. So this is in the exact same location that it is currently. And it proposes moving the curb cut because there's one uh, existing for 164, proposes moving that curb cut a little further to the north. So it's retaining the same number of curb cuts. These will be full access curb cuts, both of these. So entering and exiting motions at, at both of the curb cuts. Um, and then it's, it, was, it was fitting in, it was listening to the local historic district commission, which, you know, as I described before, we had townhouses connected here, we had townhouses here and then townhouses here. And we heard from them and we heard from the neighbors to say, that said, we would like some more open space. We also had a, a, a detention basin back here. Um, so what we've done is in those 17 units, we've separated them into one, two, three, four duplexes, uh, a building with four units and a building with five units. So you, like I said, you've got 17 altogether. We would propose four two bedroom units, one three bedroom unit and 12 four bedroom units. Wait, four two bedroom, one three bedroom and then 12 four bedroom. And the idea here is um, families, professors, uh, athletic staff. And so you'll see when Jonathan starts to go through the floor plans, this isn't bedroom, bathroom parity. You're not talking four bed, four bath. You're not talking about the same size bedroom and um, across the board. You've got what I'll designate as a, a, a master. And then you've got three auxiliary bedrooms. And, and the idea is, you don't get a second chance to, to build. And so, especially given COVID, uh, a lot of folks are working from home. Um, we wanna have the opportunity for families, for home offices, for play spaces, et cetera. And so what you see when Jonathan presents is on the inside, you know, having that family idea translates to the outside because what you've also got is, and I'll show in some of the further slides, you'll have what's called defensible spaces in the front of these units uh, we're proposing a hedge with gates leading to each of the units. You've got backyards behind these rear units here. You've got a community garden proposed for this area. You've got a natural exploration area here. So think, you know, um, lumber stumps, tree stumps stuck into the ground um, and other natural um, playscapes, if you will. You've got a, a pergola seating area here. So, you know, for folks with children who are playing or attending to the community garden, you've got a open um, or a, a pergola space. And then here you've got uh, open grass area. And so really the idea is to invite families and, and to make it a, a community. You know, we're sensitive to the, the density that exists just to the north of us 
And then there's density to the south of us, but they're in the nature of single family, two family, non-owner occupied homes. So using this as a little bit of a transition space between the university and the balance of the sunset neighborhood was, was the idea. On the northerly edge, there are, uh, we're, we're keeping these trees that exist. Uh, this is on uh, Fearing. We're keeping those trees. We're keeping the parking spaces that exist on the street. There are arborvitaes proposed and immediately behind those arborvitaes will be a four foot high fake um, full wrought iron fence. There's a grade change. Everything slopes from east to west. So the grade goes this way. We've got 43 parking spaces here. 18 of those are proposed to be compact along this side. You've got your parking, uh, sorry, your loading uh, dumpster area here. And one of the nice things is the, the internal, at least I think, the internal site circulation. So you've got, you know, um, sidewalks, ADA accessible sidewalks, and then sidewalks in the back, along with, you know, switch back to get so it's accessible all the way to this, this patio area. So, you know, it's one of the things that we, we tried to make it as kind of community friendly as possible. I'll show you some additional um, rendering. So this is from the Northeast looking, again, you've got community gardens and you've got, and these are all relative to scale. We've got another top down look. We've got those arborvitaes on that North side. You've got the fence enclosed um, trash enclosure. I've got the site plan if folks are interested in seeing it. It's, you know, compared to the colored renderings, it's with all due respect to the engineers who I, who I know are here, you know, it's a little blase. I'm happy to dwell on it if you like. We also have the landscaping plan where you can see the volume of plants. That, that rendering, I think, really does a good job of capturing the number of plants. I think there's over 400 plants, I think 79 trees altogether that are proposed to be planted. Specifically, you know, you've got five red maples to be planted here. One of the things that we've talked about with the public shade tree is we're calling for them to be one to two inches. I think you know, based on some of the public comment, we're gonna increase those to three to five inches. So you're talking about a 20 to 25 foot tree right off the bat up on the street. Uh, we've got a photometric plan, you know, some of the lighting that you'll actually see in the rendering and you've got no light bleed here. We're also adequately illuminating that amenity space as well to, you know, it's finding that balance of not making it, you know, inviting off hours, but safe. Uh, so if a family wanted to be out there, they could. And then I'll go through, you know, some of the, the ground level renderings and some of the other renderings. So this is, I think this is uh, south, um, south easterly looking to that five unit. And so you would have I think it's a four bedroom here, a four bedroom here, a three bedroom here. And then as you enter from the rear, there are two, two bedrooms, uh, which are at least one of them is accessible. And Jonathan can correct me if both of them are accessible. Uh, but as you'll see, you know, we've got that planted hedge, we've got gates in front of each of the units and then the, the sidewalk penetrations leading to the units. I'll let Jonathan talk about, and I don't wanna steal his thunder for, the trim, the shingles, et cetera. But really here, what you see is, is what you get. Um, here's a view all the way to the west, looking back east, you've got that natural play area that we talked about, the pergola sitting area. You've got community space. You've got the uh, fences in between these units. Um, and then some out, outdoor play, outdoor grass play area, and then the backyards. And you can see to the north, the arborvitae and the fence, uh, that wrought iron fence. You've got one of the, the parking area, the loading area. Again, you know, you've got, it's a, it's a retaining wall that you'll have here because the site dips down from the surrounding grade. Another, another photograph of that natural play area in the context of the towers in the background. Again, in, in this one is at the southerly side of the property. Uh, along the parking area. Um, so the duplexes are proposed to have four bedrooms in each of them. And Jonathan, again, we'll talk about that a little bit more. I talked about that five unit up along Sunset. This one here has four units. It's got a two bedroom 
uh, above a two bedroom in the middle and then four bedrooms on each side of it. And then the duplexes that flank it each have four bedrooms. Again, this is from um, the north looking south, the community garden. And these are the types of lights that we are proposing. Again, looking out towards the, the rear there, community garden, pergolate area, fenced in area with the plantings being proposed. This is a long um, sunset. And so you see the, the duplexes, the hedgerows with the street trees and um, the gates. And then again, looking, this is that five unit. This is one of the entry driveways. And then last but, but not least, this is the creamery building is over here. It's that white blob, um, respectfully. And then you've got your the five unit and then those duplexes there. And then you obviously see the, the towers in the background. So uh, process from here, you know, we're hoping for a positive. We're, we're obviously open to listen. Um, we've put, hopefully, as you can see, a lot of thought into this design. Um, it's it's going to come down to marketing. We've already talked to, tried to talk to UMass, Tony Maroulis specifically, to reach out to try to see if there's something that, uh, that this would make sense for university uh, to have professors, administrators, et cetera, um, be residing here in, in such close proximity to the university. And then, like I said, it, it comes down to marketing and and marketing to families, and we hope the amenities and once you see the floor plans, um, that those influence who's going to reside here, and then also the materials, and they're going to be higher end materials. Um, and I think you know when you put that whole package together, plus the management that you know Barry's going to manage it, you you really got yourself a, a nice project, especially with some affordable units. It's going to increase the tax base. It's going to provide housing, which is obviously much needed in town. Uh, with that, I'm happy to go back through any of those slides, ask, ask me any questions that there are. Otherwise, I can turn it over to Jonathan and he can, he can walk you through the floor plans if you'd like to go to that next. All right. Um, well, would you, do you want to go through the floor plans or your? Sure. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're happy to. That's, might as well, Give you yeah, the whole... I guess I'd, I'd like to get through whatever you want to present. Um, I don't know if you want to, if Andrew, Andrew wants to. Uh, actually, Andrew, I see your hand. What would you I, I'm, I'm happy. Yeah, thanks, Doug. And thanks, Tom. I'm happy to wait. I just had some questions relative to Tom's presentation, but yeah, now I, or later is fine. Yeah, I have some questions too, but I think I think we're probably better off what, seeing what you want to present and then going through our questions. Dive into the the next piece. Some of this will be repetitive, but, but I hope hope not too overly so. As I try to pick the right thing from my screen here, there we go. Do you see some images of the existing houses? Yes. Great. Um, just to yeah, I'll, and since Tom went over some of this, I'll I'll try to be really brief. Um, but just a couple more images of the two existing structures um, at, at 164 and 174 on Sunset. Um, just and here I'm kind of thinking about the scale of them. These houses are 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 very common when it comes to the scale in this neighborhood. Um, but there are also some larger homes which we'll look at in a second. But um, you know this is this is very typical for this neighborhood, and we were encouraged strongly by. Um, the local historic district to, to, to work as much as we could um, in, in this kind of size and form and, and level of detail um, and, and architectural expression. Uh, just a couple more shots. Uh, obviously, the creamery is across the street. It's a larger building, um, but there are some larger homes. Um, and, 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 and these are going to be more comparable to in scale to the, to the two larger buildings that, that we have proposed, um, you know, the ones that are, are Kind of one bay bigger than the uh, than the than the, than the duplexes, um, and again this last row at the bottom just some more typical kind of character images for for the neighborhood. Um, and I'm I'm going to go through this slide really quickly because it really does completely re repeat what Tom was just saying. Um, we have four duplexes that that are that's these building types here, two apartment buildings, um, uh, and with one at the back and one at the front. 
Um, as Tom was noting, you know, this building has a, a four bedroom, a three bedroom, and another four bedroom uh, kind of off the street with accessible um, uh, flat type units uh, accessible from the, from the rear. And then this structure, um, again, there's uh, a four bedroom, a four bedroom, and then two flats uh, stacked on top of each other here in the center with the first floor uh, one uh, fully accessible. Uh, this really is a, you know, just kind of another image of it. I will walk through these quickly because they're very similar, but at an earlier stage of the landscaping, don't have the, the trees and whatnot. But again, we we're trying to evoke a, 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 a kind of typical um, streetscape uh, form and, and language um, that, that corresponds to, to the neighborhood. So that this is obviously at the corner of Fearing and Sunset, and this one is uh, uh, at that southern end of our project area uh, on, on Sunset. And that's that, that larger unit. That's one of the two sort of apartment type units. Um, just to, to kind of look at them uh, in, in more of an architectural elevation, I, I have full sets, but uh, because they're not colored, these read better. So I, I, I want to kind of, kind of quickly walk through folks through the, the, the level of detail and, and architectural expression. Um, but, you know, we're trying to do a nice higher end architectural shingle, shingle on the roof, uh, you know, traditional double hug windows. We're going to vary the, the light pattern. Some buildings have a sort of a six over six light pattern. Some have a one over one. Um, we're going to vary the, uh, the color, obviously. Um, and we may, may also do some variance in, in, the, in the style of, of the clabbered as well. Um, but, you know, final materials for some of these things haven't been picked yet. Um, but we're trying to pick up, you know, very traditional kind of porch and bay elements um, and, and entry elements. Uh, and even though this is a, you know, duplex, have it read as, as, as the form and the kind of scale of a single family home. Just a close up of one of these because those that last page was a little far away. Uh, again, you know, a clabbered corner boards, uh, a water table uh, kind of uh, trim band. Um, this, this particular unit has a, a six over uh, one light pattern. So now I'm gonna switch, if you can all bear with me for a second, to the, uh, the full architectural sets. Make sure I get the right one here. So I'm gonna start with the duplex uh, units, but for us, this is, this is building type A. Um, there are again four of them. One, two, three, four. Folks can see that 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 small rendered image. Um, and uh, go to the floor plans. Over here on the right, we have the the ground floor plan, the first floor plan. Um, this would either you know they'd be either entered from the sunset uh, kind of street sidewalk or they'd been entered from the parking lot. The basements are mostly unfinished. There are small sort of laundry uh, laundry areas. The the ones that are um, have the parking lot downslope could also have a mud room and a, and a back entry, um, which we thought would be a very attractive kind of thing. But um, you know, once you enter into the building, uh, there's a closet. There's an open uh, eating living space, uh, an open kitchen at the back. There's one uh, one bathroom at this at this level. And then moving up, the typical uh, second floor plan is here on the left uh, with a larger uh, bedroom here with a walk-in closet, uh, a second bathroom for the, for the building, and then three bedrooms with it that are similar in size. Um, and as Tom said, some of these may be used as uh, nurseries or as office space, um, but it gives people flexibility. Uh, Unless I, I'll have these if people want to come back and look at them. I think those the color uh, versions, the elevations kind of uh, tell more of the story. Um, but again, uh, along the, the, the front, whether that be sunset or the parking lot, that's a, a kind of typical elevation with an entrance for each uh, unit and a, uh, and a rear entrance uh, off the backside. And you can, you can kind of see the, the, the slope uh, and the amount of grade we have to to work with on this site, it, it, it basically drops off of about a full uh, story level between front and back. And that, that's typical whether we're uh, on the street on, on Sunset or in that, that back grouping. 
So I'm going to put this one down and pick up the next unit type. B. So this is the B unit or the B building, which is that unit right here in the back. Um, as we were talking about earlier, there's a sort of townhouse style unit at either end and two flats uh, in the middle. Uh, again, uh, not much development at the, the basement level. Uh, uh, again, laundry room uh, for the two townhouse style storage space for the, for the flats. So the, the flanking townhouse style units are, are really uh, almost identical to the, 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 the um, duplex units, um, but the units in the center are, are, are what's different in this building. So there's a common entry point uh, with an accessible, a fully accessible flat type unit, uh, two bedroom unit uh, in the center. Again, an open living, dining, eating area, uh, laundry, two bedrooms, and a, a fully accessible bath. Moving to the second floor level, again, the town house type units have a large uh, bedroom and with a closet and an additional bath and the, the three accessory or additional uh, bedrooms. In the middle, we have uh, the second of the flats up a flight of stairs. Uh, again, another open living kitchen, uh, dining space, two more, two, two bedrooms again, and, an, uh, and a bathroom. This unit obviously wouldn't be fully accessible as it's on the second floor. Again, from the um, sort of parking lot side, that, that's the entry into the, the common entry into the accessible flat at this level and the flat above it, and then the two flanking townhouse type units. Put up our last building type here. Oh, there it is. This is building C. That's this uh, building at the, the sort of southeast uh, corner of our, our project area. Um, at this level, they are townhouse style units. Uh, this is a three bedroom unit at this end and then two uh, four bedroom units. And, uh, but at the back, entered from the back, um, are the two uh, potentially fully accessible, whether they're both be fully accessible, uh, we'll, we'll have to uh, sort out as, as we move it forward. Um, but we have the potential at least for two fully accessible units at this level, entered off a common entry and a, with a common hallway. Um, again, that, you know, sort of open living kitchen eating area, two bedrooms, uh, accessible uh, bath and uh, laundry facility. And then uh, entered from the street side, uh, again, that, that, that common sort of uh, townhouse type layout that we've, that we're using throughout the development uh, with the open uh, living, dining, kitchen area, a, a bath at the first floor level, because we're occupying the, the basement with, with additional units. Uh, the laundry is in this building is at uh, the first floor level for, for all three units. And again, uh, a combination of uh, a larger uh, uh, bedroom and, and smaller bedrooms. Here's that uh, three bedroom unit with a, with a larger bedroom kind of off the bay that's on the, the, the front, the street side of the, the building, walk-in closet, two additional uh, bedrooms uh, in the back. And then uh, elevations, uh, this is the street facade with the, the primary entries for the, for the townhouse units. And then viewed from the back, that's that common entry for the two flats that are located at that, that ground floor level. That was fairly quick, but, uh, um, and I can take this down or leave it up as, as folks want or bring anything back as questions come up, but maybe I'll take it down so everybody can yeah, see. Yeah, Jonathan, faces. why don't we, thank, thank you, thanks. Why don't we go back to the site uh, conversation and get that, get those comments taken care of, and then we'll come back to Jonathan's. Um, and Tom, I guess you should be prepared to put your, some of your materials back up. Uh, Andrew, why don't you kick start us off? Thanks, Doug. Thanks, Tom and Jonathan. 
Um, I, I, I just want to say to start, like, I love this. I think this is like a great project and, and I think a wonderful sort of transition between high rise and, and the sort of the, the almost boulevard of just beautiful um, houses that you have along sunset. Um, so, so with that, a uh, couple of quick questions. The, the Arbor Vites, um, those are like normally really big, like 40, 50 feet. So what's the plan for keeping those, you can just have them head, like uh, trimmed down to what height? Are you talking about along yeah. the street here? It, exactly, yeah. So when we had met on site, um, I think it was with the local historic district commission, there was some discussion, I know Ben from the planning department was there. There was some discussion just about how the dorms act as, you know, sound reverberates off the dorms. And so, you know, and it comes this way as well. And so really to try to get something as a vegetative screen that grows up so that there is uh, not only like a physical separation and, and maybe a subconscious separation from the university and from the dorms, but also um, an, an auditory separation. So I, I, at this point, the plan is just to, to let them grow up. Okay, because they'll, they'll grow huge, yep. right? And I guess just they wouldn't fit certainly under those maples if, if those were maples there. I, I, I think you said these, they were. And these are high. existing over those are These are existing yeah. trees over here. And okay. Um, you know, text message is a wonderful thing. Our landscape architect uh, just texted me and said the ones that we have proposed max out at 20 feet. So those those are the ones that he's called for, the ones that have a 20 foot height um, maximum. Um, okay, but uh, but so still a pretty 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 big visual barrier. Correct. Um, okay. Um, the other sort of quick questions I had. Um, I noticed you specifically did not mention anything about students. Um, is the objective here that you will not allow students in? No, we, we will. I mean, one of the things that um, I've talked to, to Barry about is um, the dangers that come with trying to prohibit students, you know, kind of carte blanche and saying, no, students aren't allowed. Um, I mean, Anybody who's responsible is, is welcome to be here. I think there's just, I mean, you've been in this town long enough. I've been working in this town long enough to know that people's mind, they see something like this, they go, undergraduate students, oh my gosh, it's right next to the university. What are you doing? This is gonna ruin the neighborhood. And I think what we're trying to say is we're sensitive to that. That's not this intent. We, we could pack down, you know, four bedroom, four bath units or propose at least, who knows how far you get, four bedroom, four bath units and say, yeah, it's, it's going to be undergraduate housing or tongue in cheek say it's going to be family here. There, there's an earnest effort. Um, and we're going through those other mechanisms, like talking to UMass, talking to the athletic department at UMass, building it with um, that natural exploration area, et cetera, to, to try to invite families so that you, you've got to hit that tipping point or that threshold where it starts to self-regulate because it becomes easier to manage the investment in the asset is a lot better because you don't have people destroying it. Um, and you know, I mean, most of you know Barry and, and what he's done and he's earned his reputation and it's something that he'd like to keep and not be getting calls of, wow, I can't believe, you know, the Roberts property went to, you know, crap because of, so yeah, I, I was careful not to say because I want to say, we're, that's not the, um, those aren't the occupants we're targeting. If somebody, if there, a student comes, or a group of students come and we feel very comfortable that they're going to fit in with what else we're doing here, that's a different story. We won't prohibit them, but that's not the market that we're going for. Okay, I mean, I, I certainly hope you can get some traction with the university and, the, and athletics. I think those are just wonderful opportunities if, if you can make that work. And then the other, the final question I had, maybe more for Jonathan, I was just a little confused. So I think building one is the Southeast one. Um, unit the units in the front. I, what I heard you say, Tom, is that those were accessible from the street. Are they also accessible from the parking lot, or do Are people talking about those units? Also? Yeah, is it yeah, for this here? building only? Yeah. Okay, so they're gonna they're gonna park in the parking lot, then they've got to walk up that driveway. Unfortunately, yeah, that's that's 
you know, that's the, that's the one drawback with, with this particular building is those folks don't get a back door. Okay. Um, is there, can they, can they access from the driveway? Is there like a walk on the other side as well? Or are they, they just walking back up the driveway? Tom, can you bring that, that back up? My yeah, memory I think is it's that right that up the driveway. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I'm wondering whether it would make sense to have a little path on the other side too. So they don't have to, you know, I'm just imagining, um, yeah, bags that of groceries could be a little hairy. Kind of thing. Yep. Yeah, you know, just if there's something on the on the southern edge, mm -hmm. perhaps as well, so those folks don't have to walk up, um, you know, a roadway to get to their to their yep. unit. And these folks, they these folks have they have a back um, door. They have a back door, so this yeah. is you know fully enclosed, fully enclosed. But I, to your point, it's it's the folks coming in through here. So yeah, we'll that's we'll that's think it. that's a good suggestion. We'll yep. let's let it roll through our brains a little bit. Yeah, again, great, great project. Thanks for presenting it. Thank you. All right, thanks, Andrew. Um, I have some comments, but does anybody else have some comments that, that wants to go next on the board? Janet? Um, so I think this is a really beautiful project, and I, I think you really captured the New England look, um, and it's a great fit in the neighborhood. I love the recreational space. I think that's fantastic. It's, you know, obviously people have a lot of space to spread out in. Um, I like the sidewalks. And then um, I love the family's idea. And that leads me to some of my concerns or um, maybe suggested conditions. One of the questions I have is, what were the rents that you're seeing for these, these um, properties? Like, you know, the, the two bedrooms, you know, the, I guess the different, different bedroom counts. Yeah, it's a it's a great question. Um, the answer is we don't really know yet. The, the way that we're looking at the the two bedrooms, you know, you're probably in the I don't know 2500, 26, 2700 range. Um, the four bedrooms are going to be more expensive, not double, certainly, you know, maybe 4000, 4300 a month. Um, you know, when when we thought about it, because if you were to buy, you know, I don't know how much these would be worth, let's say $600,000, $650,000, if you were to condominiumize them and sell them, which is which is not what we're looking to do. This is going to be managed and rented. Um, but when you take into account something at that value with the mortgage, so you're paying principal and interest, you're paying taxes, you're paying insurance, you're paying maintenance, you know, exterior maintenance, lawn care, snow plowing, et cetera. Um, you're probably paying interior maintenance. You know, when you total all that up, and I, and I have it somewhere, I don't have it here, you're, you're over $4,000 uh, for a four bedroom, if you were looking at a four bedroom, and you're probably over 3000 for a two bedroom. We just thought going above 3000 for a two bedroom, and that just pushes it too much, frankly. Um, so that's probably the range that we're in, something like that. The affordables will be, like I said, less than the 80%. So I think 80% might be um, you know, we're thinking about, so we've, we've done research into what units are needed. We've talked to wayfinders to find out what units they're finding, um, get filled the quickest. And those are the two bedrooms. Mm -hmm. And so for that, I think we're below a thousand dollars. I think we might be at like 900, 800, $900 per unit for those affordable units, um, okay. based upon that voucher, whatever that voucher system is, that's what, you know, Barry's going to follow. So that's, I mean, as, as we've also got, um, you know, supply, everybody knows, like, look at inflation, look at supply chain, um, labor materials, et cetera. But we think that, you know, those numbers probably make sense, um, given how much, you know, the package that you're getting. So, so I, I think the, um, the two bedrooms, the affordable one, that's a fantastic number. Cause even on, um, Northampton road, those studios are close to, I think 800 for the studio. So that would be really a great deal for a family um, to get a two bedroom at that price. I guess my concern is, I mean, probably it's not, it's obviously something you could deal with, but also the whole country is dealing with is that's a lot of money for a family. And if you could afford 4,000 a month, would you be buying a house? And then if, you know, and then even if it was affordable here, would you want to live across from the Southwest Towers um, and things like that? And so I think, you know, cause I went and looked at that and I just, those towers are really big and um, I have been around them um, after Celtics games and wins. And it's, you know, it's, it's hard for me to picture 
thinking this is like really a family friendly neighborhood, but it looks like you've done a tremendous effort to try to make it so. Um, I would suggest for the ZBA and for you is, I don't think it's bad to limit and say either, you know, only 25% undergrads or none, because I think these will be attractive to people um, and they can be attracted to people in their twenties and thirties under, you know, for graduate students. Um, and, you know, so I think that, I think you have to limit the undergraduates just in terms of the behavior because we know what that is. And so, and as much as I respect your goal of this, 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 this these units are gonna be here for decades when we're long gone and without a condition that limits the number of undergraduates in it, they will fall in, they could fall into disrepair just like those houses that you're replacing or moving have. They've just become sort of these, you know, grungy undergraduate houses with you know crummy backyards and the backyard is basically a parking lot. And so I would recommend to the ZBA that there be a limit on the percentage of undergraduates or just a requirement not to have them. And then I really hope your project works for families and for um, older people. The, the other change I would, is a quick change is, I wonder when I looked at the door, the doorways, why there isn't universal, they're not universally accessible. Like I do love the stoop and the steps, but I wondered why they were there because um, why not just have people, you know, be able to get in every doorway in an easy way. And that will be, you know, better for people if they wanted to have an older relative living with them. Or as we all know, Andrew, sometimes it's really hard to get around no matter what age you are. And so that would be my recommendation that people be able to just step into the unit without those steps. And you can still have some very attractive like kind of granite entry entryways. Um, and then my last comment is, I kind of picked up something from the local historic district. I think these are really attractive units, but they all kind of look the same. And I have um, two friends who have moved in con condominium projects that look a lot like this. And I can never figure out where they live because all the buildings look the same. And I wondered if that, there could be some variation in terms of like one building has shutters, some scallops, you know, or, a, you know, maybe some shingles instead of clabbered, you know, just a little more differentiation. Um, I also wondered if the building could be, some of the buildings could be white because it seemed like almost every house in the neighborhood was white. Um, but I just thought maybe a little more um, uniqueness for each building just to differentiate and kind of fit the kind of New England style where things just kind of, every house looks a little different. But I do think these are really attractive. Um, and I, I just, it's a very appealing project. I just hope it works being so close to the Southwest Towers. All right, thank you, Janet. If I could, Doug, one thing, you know, as, yeah. I, as I was listening to Janet speak, I misspoke as far as the affordable rents. I was thinking of one bedrooms for that amount. I'll get you what the two bedrooms would be for affordable. It's gonna be more than 800, um, but I just, for the record, want to make sure that I'm being accurate because once I heard you say it back, I thought, oh shoot, I just said what the one bedroom would be, and there aren't any one bedroom proposed or one bedroom affordables proposed. So I'll get you what that number is. I'll send it uh, either I think through probably Pam. So I'm sorry about the misspeaking. If if Doug, if it makes sense, I could uh, uh, just kind of respond to the question about accessibility a sure. little bit. Um, sure, Jonathan. So. We, we have a mixture. We have some that, that are obviously wheel-in uh, accessible. Um, the, some of this may come from the fact that we were really trying to listen to, to what we were hearing at the local historic district. And one of the things they noted, because the first, the first version of, of this plan that we went in with, things, things were a lot closer to grade. There was still maybe, maybe one step up, that sort of thing. It, it didn't have the same kind of uh, presence on the street that you get with a stoop and and you know that kind of two foot distance between grade and and say a, a porch or something like that. Um, what we're presenting certainly meets the the requirements of of accessibility uh, based on on code. Um, but you know, depending on on comment we get back, we we can certainly look at having more units that would be um, at least have the f the first floor uh, you know roll in accessible. Okay. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Andrew, it looks like you have your hand up again. If it's just like 30 seconds, I know uh, Johanna's up next, but I, just, I'm sorry, just back in the Arbor Vitae set that, that uh, I think it was page 12. I, I would, I think it would probably be useful to know the, the aerial, the aerial street view, maybe not 
can be, yeah, there, I'm sorry, page 10. It might be useful to actually show those as 20 foot if that's your intent um, or like a street view of it because that's like a pretty intimidating wall. Um, and that may be your design intent, but I think like it's definitely not clear to me that it was. Okay. Okay, thanks. Thanks, thanks Andrew. Uh, Johanna. Great. Thanks for the opportunity. It's exciting to see this project. I worked in the creamery building basement for many years and have walked this corner many, many times. And I think um, especially the streetscape on sunset, um, I think it just really works. Um, and I can imagine, you know, those sidewalks kind of just seamlessly flowing into the rest of the neighborhood. Um, my questions have to do with um, sustainability. Um, so I, I think the things that I like about this plan is, you know, the relative density of housing. Um, but I'm curious just how much you looked at on-site solar production, rooftop solar, whether parking lot solar was something you had talked about or considered at all, but then scrapped, as well as EV charging infrastructure. Um, and then I'm also just curious about the um, fuel sources for the heating, space heating, water heating, and cooking in the buildings themselves. Because um, we got problems in this world yes. and the stuff we build now. <laughs> uh is gonna be around when you know it, it's just it's easier to start from scratch than it is to retrofit so i'd love to hear your thoughts on that sure and, and jonathan I'll, I'll have you answer about rooftop solar etc and the heating systems in, in a minute i'm just going to talk about parking lot solar um and yeah we look at it for all our projects the problem is that the, the cost of that steel to raise I mean, you see it at UMass and UMass has done, a, I mean, those are the Cadillac of um, parking lot canopies. The problem is they're really, really expensive. Um, and, and you're not getting necessarily a, a, a real appreciable um, solar footprint here. And it's not necessarily oriented in the right direction because so this is, is north south. You could have panels. Um, but you know, we, we have not done an analysis. I know that there's programs where you can say, okay, on December 21st of any year, what do you have for sunlight actually hitting? And that's where like solar developers look to see this is what at the weakest day it's going to be. You know, I would, I would bet that given the surrounding vegetation offsite that we can't really control plus the orientation of the parking lot and the cost of it, it's not gonna work. So we looked at that EV we are gonna, we're not gonna provide a charging station yet. Uh, Barry has one at his 70 University Drive property and he can probably tell you nobody uses it or not many people use it. What we're gonna do here though is prep the site for it. So we'll have conduit um, and I think uh, an electric meter. So when it's time to, and when folks, once that comes, we'll be able to have a separate dedicated meter to the EV charging stations. Um, you know, we thought about in that amenity space doing, because that's a, probably where the community garden is, is a great space for solar panels. Um, but the trade-off is either community garden space or, or solar panels. It may be something where we see community gardens are never or not used or minimally used, and then we pivot to that. But if I were to put it somewhere, that's probably where I would put it. Um, and then, I'll, Jonathan, if you want to talk about rooftop and yeah. um, heating sources. Yep, I can do that. Um, you know, I would have loved it if the grades were like 90 degrees to, to what we actually have on site so that we could have oriented this, this project in, in another direction. But we do have some opportunities. These are, these are south facing slopes. Um, and with the efficiency of, of the panels today, even the west facing slopes would, would be an opportunity. Um, but it is not as ideal as I would have necessarily liked it. Um, uh, but I do think there, there is an option or an ability to put PV on these buildings and 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 be able to generate some some uh, uh, electricity. Uh, while Barry and I have not sat down to to like go through each building and and say categorically what our different systems are, um, I do know that based on past experience, it's likely to be an all electric system. 
Um, that's what the, the two projects most recently we've done with Barry are um, so that in all likelihood, there's probably not going to be any fossil fuel for space heating. Um, water heating is, is tough. Um, I, I would like to find us a way to get us to a point where we could be all electric on that as well um, and move away from fossil fuels. Uh, but but uh, at least for our most recent project, it's, it's still been a little, a little bit of a stretch and we're still looking at gas. Um, but we have not gotten to that level of detail for, for these buildings yet. Um, but uh, it's basically, uh, it'll be a series of, of, uh, of mini splits and con with condensers outside, which you know, we're gonna have to go through the process of placing. Um, uh, what, did, what have I forgotten? Oh, as Tom said, we, did, we have talked about being EV ready um, and, and you know, where those are gonna go on so site, I don't think we've necessarily chosen the spot for, but it is something that we would um, be working forward towards uh, as the project develops further. Did I miss something, Johanna? don't think so. I realized I had two more questions on my list that I didn't get to. I think you, I think you address, yeah, all my questions. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Jonathan. And thanks, Johanna. Maria. Doug, could I, could I ask my other two questions or oh, do you want oh, to come back okay. to me? Okay. I thought you said he answered those. Okay. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. Um, the, the other question that I had um, had to do with pedestrian connectivity to the community space. So um, it seems to me like the way that the layout is right now, that community space is highly accessible to the residences in the back, but pretty separate from the ones in the front in the sense that, you know, like, I don't know, I was imagining like, what if I had a three-year-old and I, was like, go play. Where would that three-year-old walk if you live in the you know building in the lower right? And I was like, wow, I'd be sending her across the parking lot. Like, I don't love that. And and so I wonder if so. In addition to the idea of a you know making sure there's a sidewalk along the driveway to the parking lot on the sunset side, I wonder if there could just be a little bit more thought about where where do pedestrians from the front, how do they access the community space safely? And imagine a three-year-old on a scooter, I think is how I'm thinking about it. All right, is that, that's both of your uh, comments? Sorry. Yes, that's it. All right, um, Jonathan, I don't know if you need to respond to that, but that is, this would be a good chance if you want to say anything. Otherwise, we can go on to Maria. I think that's a, that's that's something we should give a little bit more thought to. You know, I do think that that we while we have provided the pathways, it is if you're in this corner unit and you can't see my mouse. <laughs> Thank you. If you're in that, if you're in that unit, you do you have do have to uh, cross. Uh, you know, a, 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 certainly a parking lot and, and maybe a, a driveway to 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 follow the path that we've kind of designated. And as we all know, three year olds don't necessarily do that. And it, and it looked like in the description that you actually have more parking spaces than are required. So you, you could potentially lose a space on each side of the bay and you know, have a little more connectivity. That, that's true. We didn't really talk in, in, I mean, Tom sort of talked about the number of parking spaces, but we didn't, we didn't kind of talk yeah. about that parking density. Yeah. I don't know, Tom, did, have you and Barry talked more uh, internally about, about what the right number is likely for, for this development? No, I mean, so frankly, part of it is to see what the feedback is, like with planning board feedback, zoning board feedback. Sometimes we've been through this enough to know some people say one thing, other people say the exact opposite thing. So if we design it with the parking that we can fit and then we hear, you know, hey, on balance, this is really important to us. Why don't you get rid of two parking spaces? I think we could see our way clear to eliminate two parking spaces to, to have that um, thoroughfare. You know, I, I don't see that as being an issue, but if I hear from the ZBA, we want every parking space that you have, then, you know, to a certain right. extent, we're the pawns in this. Right. Well, I think our purpose tonight is to vet, to air some comments and, you know, you can do what you want with them before you see the ZBA, but, you know, this is just, this is just feedback. 
Uh, Maria. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. And um, I just want to start with big picture stuff. This project really shows you like how effective our zoning and how the various sort of department and developers and um, planning board and building department all working together can come together and create this great project because we so need housing. And this is that sort of missing middle sort of flag I've been carrying for my term on this board is this is exactly what we need. We need this sort of starter home, this sort of mm, like missing sort of um, economic sort of community that sort of has to move you know outside of Amherst in order to work in Amherst. And I think this is just, the thing we need and we need more of it and so it's great that you found this parcel it's such an ideal location um <clears throat> and to do this number of units uh that transitions between you know the scale of university to a neighborhood so i think it's conceptually fantastic um i won't comment on the architecture because that's so subjective but I, I think it fits the neighborhood just as you designed it um and i'm glad we're talking about this sort of issue of pedestrians and cars because I do feel like the project is very car centric it feels very much about like you know we have enough parking and in fact here's more parking and in fact here are two ways to get in and out and it does feel like there's a lot of accommodations for cars and like you've heard from the planning board members um how do people move through the site you know from their front door to their car or how does a child get from their front door to the community space so I think that's a, those are all really good feedback to think about like how a human you know from each front door occupies it and walks down a street, whether they're going into town or going to their job somewhere or to the um, green space, that really great green space you provided. So um, I guess those those are sort of big picture questions um, which don't need to be answered just, just to think about. But the more detailed ones are, well, I know you've gone through so many boards and reviews. Uh, is there a reason for the two access points by cars? Is that a code thing or the fire department asked, you know, as far as like. Yeah, so fire department circulation. You um, did that. Yeah, they'll come in and then they'll be able to come out here. Gotcha. And so they'll be able to circulate the, the site. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. And then the other site question is um, all those little gates you have in the front yards on sunset. Is that sunset referring sunset? sunset? Are those just like a visual barrier? Because they're certainly people could just step over the bushes, right? They're not really a barrier in a way. All those little private sort of gates you have there, the black ones. Yeah. So I mean, the, the intent is for these to be actual gates, you know, in, impediments to folks entering, and uh -huh. these the the landscape you know, will grow over time. These will be hedges mm -hmm. that will be maintained, and so ultimately, you know, they'll okay. grow up. And mm -hmm. think of it. I think we, we I might have Googled like English cottage. That's kind of the idea that you're thinking about here with those hedges with the gates in between. So yeah, to give, and I think we, we had heard at the local historic district commission from one of the abutters about a term that I didn't know, but defensible spaces. And, and that's really what we're looking to do here where you have that sense of ownership over that portion of the space. I see. Okay. Yeah, because it felt a little like formidable, like do not enter. But I see what you're saying. You're just trying to provide, like, you know, here's our yard, and you All know, right. it's private, but it's not saying stay out necessarily. Right. I mean, it is saying stay out, but it's not in a way that's like you know, the uh, stay out in a mean Beware way. Dog. Yeah. Right. Right. But um, yeah, I know. I think this is we need more projects like this. This is fantastic, and I'm glad that it's gone through iterations and you've really responded and taken input for the various boards and department staff and whatnot and um i yeah i think the only criticism i would have is really think about how people of different ages different abilities move through the site you know with their feet like literally like um and i i would definitely be pro reducing parking considering the location and proximity to the university and to downtown um yeah, more more green space, more sidewalks, uh, less cars. I mean, the more you sort of push toward that as far as a trend, the more, you know, we we as a community can think that way too, instead of, you know, predominantly relying on the car. But overall, I, yeah, I, I, I kind of echo what a lot of other people have said about this project. I think it's great and um, really well thought out and hope we see more like this. So, um, but thank you. Thanks a lot. All right, Maria, uh, Tom. Thanks, Doug, uh, and thanks, guys, for the presentation. I, I'm not going to have too many comments because I really appreciate everyone else's comments. I do think circulation is a, a big issue, so um, I think that's something that I was going to comment on. 
Um, the, the other thing I want to comment on is about the architecture, but not so much as a critique. Um, but I, I think that what makes these attractive in the way that we're not, not attractive, what, what makes them not unattractive <laughs> in some ways um, and fitting maybe more in with the district um, is the architectural detail. And I just get concerned that those things get value engineered out. And that's the plantings, that's the pavings, that's the, you know, the, the window details, the box out for the, you know, the sort of white box outs on the, on the front. So I just, I want to make sure that that's a priority to like preserve those architectural details, even if they have to become vinyl or whatever it is to keep them there. Um, I'd like to, I'd like to see that maintained because I do think they can really start to feel institutional if you strip away some of those things. And, and that's just my concern. But um, but otherwise, it's, I think, you know, great project that we're fitting this many units into this site with this much green space, that's super pleasing to me. So um, that's all I have to say. Thanks so much. Okay, Tom. Just to respond to that, Mr. Chair, I will, yeah. I'll say it simply, what you see is what you get here. So what we're proposing is what, well, ultimately, you know, assuming we get the approval from the Zoning Board of Appeals, I would expect from them a condition that says you have to build it substantially in accordance with the plans and the plans show what they show. So what you see here as far as the plan things, I mean, we've gone through, you know, a lot of cost, expense, thought, detail to get to this place. So hopefully once we get the thumbs up, that's what, you know, then we just release folks to actually order the materials and, and to do the work. So it's a, a lot of upfront cost, but if this is approved, this is what you're going to get. Uh, thanks, okay. Tom. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Janet? So I just have a few um, extra things. Is I think you're going to need a lot of EV chargers, maybe not this year, but so when you're putting in the, the electrical works, um, I've already had problems, like when I've tried to charge my EV, my hybrid EV, that there's no spaces. So. I think that time is coming closer and closer and um, you're gonna wind up having a lot of competition. And so I would think about putting them so pretty much anybody, you know, a, a, at least half the cars would be charging. Um, if they're level two charges, they'll go faster, but if it, the car is all electric, it's gonna take a long time. So just looking to the future, I would really think about what's coming, um, which, which is good. Another idea, just from hearing Johanna and people talk, is maybe thinking about paths. And so maybe on the side, um, the um, south side, there could be like a little path that someone from the front buildings could walk around to the back, or you know, across the middle of the parking lot, um, having a crosswalk or a raised crosswalk, and making a designated path between the buildings. I don't know if it has to be concrete or it could be, you know, woody or something like that, but just so people say, oh, this is where kids are crossing or people are going to cross to get to the backyard. And the other thing I'm just worrying about is families and price, because if it's $4,000 a month, that's like $48,000 a year. And I know that teachers are underpaid and UMass professors aren't probably making that much money, but I just, I just hope that, you know, in order to get the families in, you know, that's a that's a heavy lift for somebody who's working at the university, unless of course you're the UMass football coach who seems to have a phenomenal amount of money. Um, but I just you know again the cost and and the family has to be sort of met somewhere. But okay, but I do I do think this is a very attractive project. So I appreciate the local historic district and everybody else putting in their in the effort of the architects and Mr. Roberts. All right, thanks, Janet. Um, so I'll go ahead and just read through the comments that I had. Um, I'll, um, and you don't, you know, you don't particularly need to respond. I know we're getting close to eight o'clock when we usually take a break and we have some other things. Um, these are not really in any order except the order of the sheets as I saw them. Um, on your verbal description under the parking section, I did wonder why you had more parking spaces than required. Um, conversely, uh, farther down in that parking session, section, you talked about the, the parking registration system, which caused me to wonder about how visitors would be treated. So I do, you know, I mean, obviously these people may have visitors and you need a way to make sure that they can park in the lot. So maybe you do need a few extra spaces, but I, I, I just questioned whether you really needed, you know, uh, 
as many as you shared. Um, then the next uh, comments were on the site plan. Um, when I look at the uh, path that goes next to the dumpster down to the western edge of the site, uh, I saw some steps right before you get to the um, whatever it's called. I, I, it's got a bike rack. Uh, and so, yeah, it's those steps right there. First of all, as a bicycle rider, I'd rather not have to ride my bike, carry my bike up and down steps. So maybe the bike rack ought to be on the top of side of the steps rather than down at the bottom. Um, and then in addition, uh, those steps are an obstacle to any person in a wheelchair who wants to get to some of the amenities that are out uh, west of your building. Um, oh, is that a ramp? Okay. There is, yeah. So there's, it's stairs okay. and Thank there's you. a ramp that goes around that little planted area. Okay, good. So that, that takes care of that. And I had not picked that up. Um, and then on the next sheet, the uh, grading plan, um, I noticed that the retaining wall along Fearing Street is probably 10 feet high by the time you get to the, uh, the uh, west end of it. And um, that seemed awfully high, um, even with arborvitaes in front of it, um, which I guess leads to a little bit larger question. Um, I guess I was a little disappointed that all the buildings that, that you didn't have some buildings facing Fearing Street and addressing both, both streets. Um, it seemed like the project really does turn a very blind eye to Fearing Street. And I understand that there's the university across the street, but um, certainly Fearing Street has some street, some uh, units that are some houses that front it farther up the street. Um, so, the, the height of that retaining wall seemed pretty daunting, first of all. And second of all, the, the existing street trees along Fearing Street are very substantial trees. And um, I, I did stop there on my way home last uh, this evening. Um, and I do wonder whether the construction of the retaining wall and maybe the planting of the arborvitae might irreparably damage the existing trees along there. Um, so I believe Fairing Street is owned by UMass in this section. Correct. Um, and I'm seeing uh, nodding from Tom and Jonathan. I, I hope you've been in conversation with somebody at UMass about the actual impact of this, some of this construction on the trees in particular, because I know UMass is you know, keeps pretty close watch of particularly their larger trees. And then um, along Fearing Street, there isn't any sidewalk at the moment. And um, I, I know that those trees are large enough that they would really obstruct any, the creation of a sidewalk. Um, and I guess I just wondered, is your retaining wall and your Arborvitae set far enough back that at some point there could be a reasonable sidewalk along Fearing Street. All right, so that was another question. Um, uh, if you scroll up uh, to on this particular page toward the toward the west edge of the site, um, uh, actually, I guess it was on the grading plan, which was sheet number five. And I don't have that in this set. I, I okay, didn't wanna, all right, I well. Grading, but we can, of, we can talk about it. Well, there was a, uh, a riprap discharge from the water collection system. Yes. And um, I just wanted to question whether the, the amount of discharge would be causing significant erosion or you know whether that is likely to be a problem with your abutter to the west. Doug, okay. so maybe just let me hop on a couple of these because you're asking, I mean, some really, really great questions. Um, as far as the retaining wall, it's more like five to six feet, not 10 feet. Uh, as far as the discharge, so there's a, there's what you see with this like 
grayed out hatched yep. area, that's a subsurface infiltration system. And the, the overflow is what's gonna go to that riprap area over here. So you know, based on the calculations, I don't think we anticipate that being used too often. Um, okay. And you know, we'll go through, we'll talk to Jason to make sure that he's okay with the amount of riprap that we have at the bottom so that that water, the speed and the volume dissipates. And so it doesn't scour or cause any erosion uh, down gradient. This is your civil engineer? Uh, Jason Skeels, but yeah, I mean, our civil okay, engineer that, has certainly Jason. looked at it. And it's, so it's uh, Phil Henry and Matt Leidner from Civil Design Group. We've used them on 70 University Drive, University Drive South. So they've, and it, what they design works. So we've been very okay. pleased with what they've done. All right. Um, well, I, I, I'm glad to hear the retaining wall is not as high as it looked like. I was squinting at the uh, grading numbers and uh, it, it certainly looked like it was higher. Um, and then I guess the only, then the last, the last comment was about the sort of semicircular grading at the west edge of the site, um, which, you know, Jonathan, I realized that this is a very steeply sloping site and, um, you know, ideally it would be flat um, and you've sort of tabled it, stepped it down toward the west. Um, but the, just looking at the number of topo lines on that semicircle, um, you know, it feels like almost the prow of a ship um, jutting out to the west. Um, so it, it felt like, you know, between the retaining wall and this grading to the west, I think there was some mention that you were doing a lot of fill. Um, and I can imagine you're trucking in a lot of material. Um, but it I felt think on, like maybe, on balance, we are we are a fill, I believe. Okay. We well, it just kind of felt like maybe it wasn't as I mean, you know. Could we soften it a bit so it wasn't? Yeah, as it felt a little bit heavy-handed in terms yep. of the 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 treatment of the site, and I think part of that was my uh, my thought that if you had a building or two that stepped down Fearing Street, you know, you wouldn't feel the need to have it flat parts quite so far to the west. Um, but you know, I realize you've been through a lot of hoops already. Um, I, I do think that it's an attractive project. Um, and um, you know, take my take my comments for whatever whatever help they can be. And maybe so I'll, if I'll I stop there. I don't know if I'll I'll be very brief just to respond because you know, I want to give the folks over at Civil Design a lot of credit for designing the site. And when they start designing these, they look at you know the roadways and making sure that they match with what the existing grade is because those are that's what's fixed. And then they kind of build the site off of there, and then they have to make the stormwater work so that the stormwater is going in the direction that it needs to go. And so you've got catch basins in the parking lot, and then that subsurface infiltration system in the rear. And what you have to do is you have to maintain a certain separation from groundwater. And that's really what one of the main reasons why we have to lift the site so much uh, is because you've got groundwater. And so then I think you have to keep it four feet so that you don't have to do what's called a mounding analysis to make sure that when that water is in the, the uh, subsurface infiltration system, it's not hitting groundwater because if groundwater is already there, then obviously there's not the storage capacity that you would have thought it was. So that's why the site is elevated the way it is, is it's to meet the existing grade, keep those grades reasonable. That's why you'll see some switchbacks over in that area by the bike rack. And then also over here, you'll see to, so that we can meet grades so that we have accessible paths throughout the site. So, you know, there, there was thought behind why we have what we have just to really, again, balance all of those different kind of competing provisions. Right, well, I figured there was, there was a reason, you know, there, it's just not obvious uh, at first glance. A um, couple of last things, um, Jonathan. When you talked about building C and the two units on the on the ground floor of that building, yes, uh, I didn't see it for very long. But the the entry sequence looked, frankly, kind of unpleasant. Um, like you went into a shared corridor and all the way to the back, and then turned left or right. Um, and it did make me wonder whether you could just have an entry off straight from the sidewalk into each unit. That's, that's true. We don't necessarily need to do that. that um, 
I don't, that, I, that just looks, you know, yeah. like you could easily make use of that space for some other purpose. Yeah, that, that's a fair. That's a fair point. Okay, great. Um, and then, um, kind of on Johanna's uh, uh, tangent about the sustainability, I wondered if you do have a target energy use intensity and EUI for these buildings, and whether they are, uh, you know, insulated only to meet code or or in excess of code. We we have not established a, an EUI yet for for this project. Okay. We, we right. well you know, obviously we haven't, we haven't, yeah we haven't st sat down with a with a you know with the the energy rating company yet you know there's there are there are some other steps we need to to kind of walk through. Okay. Well, I'm I do agree with her that the more the more sustainable and low energy use we can design into them at the beginning, the less you know, the fewer solar panels we need to put on them to make them net zero. Okay, so um, Gianna, you have a couple more questions or comments? No, okay. That was a legacy hand. Legacy hand, sorry. All right, well, thanks. Um, thanks everyone. This, 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 I really appreciated the graphics in particular for this, Tom and Jonathan. Um, you know, this is a higher level of modeling than I think we've seen, I've seen on the board. Um, and it really helps you to kind of get a sense of what you're trying to do. To that, Doug, let me just give credit, Place Alliance, Andy Bone, um, local Amherst guy, uh, South Pleasant Street, they, they've they done a terrific job. They're our landscape architect. And so between Jonathan and Kuhn Riddle, Phil and Matt over at Civil Design and, and Andy at Place Alliance and his team, I mean, we've got to thank them to, to, to um, so you can, you're seeing what you're seeing tonight. I, okay. I can't take any credit for for modeling uh, those gardens in the back. That would have taken me forever. Buildings I know how to do, getting the plants to look natural and beautiful. Uh, that that's why we have uh, we have help. Okay. All right. Um, any uh, so Chris, uh, actually Janet, I see your hand again. I was thinking if if anyone in the public had questions, I don't know if you're going to get to that. Just okay. Well, I. Uh, Sure. Uh, any attendees want to make a comment? Uh, Dorothy Pam. Please state your name and your address. Hey, Dorothy, you're on mute. Right. Dorothy Pam, 229 Amity Street. Um, well, I have been on uh, the Shade Tree site visit and on meetings uh, about this project. And we've seen it change and grow and really truthfully get much better as it goes along. So there's a, a, a lot of uh, a pleasure in that. But you know, when you showed your early pictures of the existing neighborhood, I noticed that the tree that we're trying very, the, we're trying very hard to save on the corner of Fearing and Sunset is just a, an incredible presence there. Um, almost all the pictures have the tree or its branches which reach out quite far. Uh, if you look at it from the um, south, you see it kind of blocking the towers. And um, there's been great fear that says this, the Fearing Street corridor is one widely used by students, particularly on weekends at night. And I gather a lot of drunken students do walk up and down and the, the university's Walk This Way program concentrates on that street, in fact. Um, but we were hoping that if that large tree could be spared, that it would uh, be a, a, a a reminder that this is a residential neighborhood and kind of a demarcation um, because um, we know that at some point all trees fail, but at this moment, this tree is putting out new growth and is doing well. And um, as I did point out at a meeting, I think last night, <clears throat> um, I'm pleased with the suggestion to plant larger dimension trees, but they will just still look like sticks for a number of years. They will, it'll take them a long time to look like the, the, the renderings of the picture. Um, now, I did have a couple of other questions and comments. Um, the question about the parking and, and children's safety, there is an alternative that the parking could be in the back where the common areas are and the area which is now the parking lot between the buildings could be a common area green. If in fact the building is rented as um, uh, Lawyer Reedy is suggesting to families and responsible people, that would work out fine. I do know that a large common greens are not wanted 
if a building is primarily undergraduates because it becomes just a you know incredible party space. Um, and then in answer to Johanna's question about canopies, if the parking were in the back and canopies come down or it's less expensive to build them in the future, that's a possible source of, of energy there. Um, I was also very interested in about the uh, affordable units. Um, and I'm very pleased to hear about all the accessible units. And I'm wondering if one of the affordable units will be an accessible unit. Um, and if there's a possibility of um, seniors as well as young families up. If I were a senior living alone, I would want to live in a place like this that would have varied ages and would have children. Um, it would be very attractive. Um, so I was, the, the question about that, um, question about the laundry room, I couldn't quite tell whether each unit had a shared laundry room or was it individual laundry rooms. And I also want to know about the dimension of the common space. I just couldn't get from the plan that could be really great or it could be a really small, you know, suffocatingly small room in which you're trying to do too many things in it. So I'm just curious if you could tell me the, the answer about the laundry room and the dimensions of the common space and um, any comments about the tree. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Tom or Jonathan? Or I guess Jonathan, just confirm uh, accessible will be affordable. Yes, that's my expectation that at least yep. one of the uh, yep. accessible units will also be an affordable unit. That's been a, a common request that that, that yep. we've uh, accommodated. Um, and, and I believe yes, each, each unit building, has laundry. Yes, each building has their own laundry, either in a basement space or within the, the, the main living space in some form. OK, shared. Very good. Okay. No, I don't, I don't believe it's shared, Jonathan. No, no shared. Yeah, everybody's so each, got their own. So each, each unit has a laundry space, yes. not, not each building. Yes, each unit. So uh, each duplex unit, for example, has two laundries, one in each basement. Uh, each of the flat type uh, apartment units has uh, the, the laundry, uh, you know, kind of in a laundry closet. So each, each unit has access to its own laundry facilities. OK. All right. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Dorothy. Um, I don't see any other any other hands among attendees. Uh, one last call for comments from anyone. Uh, Chris, do you have have you got enough comments to put together a letter? Um, and... Yes, I think so. Pam and I can put together a letter and um... Then uh, send it to Doug for review to make sure that we've included what you wanted to include. Is that satisfactory? That's satisfactory to me. I think the the, the one comment that I would want to make and is that I think the comments should be it should be indicated that the comments were individual comments because um, we haven't really had enough discussion to have a sense of which comments are shared by the by the board as a consensus so you know these were the comments from individuals on the board all right okay all right well thank you thank you tom and jonathan and your teams this was you know it's great to see uh and certainly a pleasant uh you know a happy project to, to look at and sounds like you've been to enough of the other boards that um, you're well on your way. Thanks good, so much good, for the good recommendations. Luck, good good luck with the ZBA. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you and have much. a good evening. Okay, so long. Thank you. All right, so that concludes um, item three on our agenda. The time is 8.09. Uh, I assume we'll go ahead and take a five minute break. Um, Every, I'm seeing some nods and thumbs. So why don't we reconvene at, in six minutes at 815. And um, in the meantime, please turn off your cameras and mute yourself and we'll be right back.
All right, it's 8.15 and I'm seeing people's cameras came back on. So Chris, um, let's see, it's 8.16. Uh, are you gonna be presenting the FEMA flood insurance? Uh, Nate Malloy is going to be presenting it, but I have a short um, introduction that I'd like to give before Nate starts his presentation. Okay, okay I, I don't see him in the panel. Uh -oh. just, just to let you know, I just got a message from him. He's restarting his computer. So hopefully by the time Chris gets done doing her, um, opening. Nate will be with us. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So the time is 817 and we're reconvening and continuing our meeting. Uh, we'll go to item four, the introduction of the FEMA flood insurance study maps and proposed bylaw. So Chris, why don't you take it away and we'll see whether you can make it long enough that Nate can get here before you're done. Mm -hmm. There he is. I see him coming in now. Okay. Okay. It looks like Johanna has an extra guest in her house. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> Very nice. Anyway, uh, okay. Hello, um, I'm Christine Brestrup, Planning Director, and I'd like to introduce you to our flood mapping project. And then Senior Planner Nate Malloy will give you a more in-depth presentation. We presented this project to Town Council in February of 2020 and in February of 2022. But this is a first look for the planning board. Although some of you may remember previous presentations at public meetings um, of the planning board and the conservation commission. The project will be going to town council in, on April 4th with a request for a referral to the planning board and the CRC for public hearings. The town of Amherst is a participant in the national flood insurance program, which is administered by FEMA. This program provides information about flood insurance for property owners whose properties lie within the 100 year floodplain. The adoption of new maps and accompanying zoning regulations requires the vote of town council. That vote needs to occur sometime in the next six to eight months. Town council will be seeking a recommendation from the planning board because this is a zoning amendment. The town has been working on this project um, on updating the flood maps since around 2012. That gives us a 10 year um, jump start on you. <laughs> been working on it for 10 years. The purpose of the project is to create accurate federally approved maps for land affected by flooding in order to provide information to banks, which grant mortgages, to landowners, to the Conservation Commission, the Planning Board, and other interested parties. Emerson flood maps have not been updated for decades. Town meeting appropriated money to work on new flood maps and the town hired a firm of technical experts called AECOM or ACOM. And they frequently work with FEMA to prepare new flood maps for municipalities and regions. In September of 2017, the preliminary flood insurance rate maps were presented to members of the planning board, conservation commission and the public. But at that time, the town became aware of a new method of analyzing flood data and determining flood boundaries. This new method had just come into use in the spring of 2017. So town meeting appropriated an additional sum of money to update the maps using the new 2017 method. The new map, mapping has now been complete. The mapping project has been presented at public meetings several times in the last four or five years, including twice at town council meetings. The maps have been through three appeal periods during which only one appeal was received. 
Most of the maps have been available for viewing by the public since June of 2019. Three of the panels have been revised recently, and these have been available for viewing by the public since July of 2021. We've issued press releases and put information on the front page of the town's website each time new maps became available for viewing. We're now initiating the process of having the maps, the zoning amendment, and the uh, flood insurance study adopted by town council. Senior planner Nate Malloy will now give you a more detailed presentation about this project and we'll be happy to answer any questions after Nate's presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Hey, Nate. Sure. Thanks, hi everyone. I'm Nate Malloy, a planner with the town. I'll share my screen and I'll go through a presentation that was in the packet and then also go through um, draft language of the bylaw. The um, Chris covered it pretty well. Um, so, you know, the town is part of the flood insurance program and it has been for, you know, since the 80s. And this allows property owners to uh, purchase flood insurance on their property. Uh, it's different than, you know, disaster uh, loans or other things. Um, the current project, you know, there's three things that the town has to adopt. It's an updated flood study, the flood maps, and then the zoning bylaw. So there's a few pieces there. Um, you know, there are benefits to being in the flood insurance program. Um, you know, residents, whether or not you're in a flood hazard area. So even if your property is not mapped as part of a flood hazard area, you still can purchase flood insurance because the town is a member or participating in the National Flood Insurance Program. Um, the town may also be eligible for some relief because we're in this program. Um, and then, you know, as part of the new update, the state and FEMA really want regulations to, um, you know, kind of guide development away from these flood hazard areas. We, we have that in our zoning um, now in some of our regulations, Conservation Commission, and that has to be bolstered with the new zoning bylaw. And really the goal of the project was to have more accurate flood maps uh, to determine if property owners are required to purchase flood insurance. Uh, so right now, you know, this is dealing with the flood insurance rate maps and then the flood hazard area will become a zoning overlay and there'll be regulations in the bylaw. We're not changing the FPC zoning right now. Uh, and we're not changing other regulations the town uses. So, um, you know, the Conservation Commission regulations are not changing um, they may, you know, reference these updated maps. In essence, they already say the flood maps of the town. So the way those regulations and bylaws are written, it will, you know, they can already use the updated maps. And so, you know, really it's um, about getting more accurate flood hazard areas. Chris went over the project history. Really, it's been, um, you know, many years in the making. Um, you know, so really we're at the final step where, um, you know, the, the maps we are using now that are adopted um, are from 1981 and 1983, and they use data that was from the late 60s and 70s. So really we're using flood maps that are, you know, decades old and we'll have uh, new ones that are much more accurate. Um, and, you know, there's a few reasons why the, the, the preliminary maps are a lot more accurate. They use um, you know, much more detailed contours. The previous maps were 10-foot contours. Uh, they're digital um, as opposed to hand-drawn on a map. Um, the analysis uses 40 years of data. So the updated regression equation Chris talked about, you know, essentially used 40 years of stream and peak flow and storm data from the Northeast region of the U.S. And some of that was in-stream gauges too, measuring flows uh, versus data from the 60s and 70s. Um, it shows actual locations of structures. It's based on um, the data is overlaid on, you know, aerial imagery. So you can actually see the structures. Uh, the current maps are the ones from the 80s. You know, the structures were hand-drawn. And so it was really hard if you were a property owner to determine where exactly was the flood boundary on your property and does it actually um, cover a structure. Uh, and then the update process did involve field surveys from the 2000s, right? So when the consultants were out here, they had engineers and surveyors on the ground looking at, um, you know, a lot of structures, um, culverts and things just to make sure to field verify that the elevations were correct. And here's, uh, there's just a few examples of what the new maps look like. 
uh, compared to the old map. So this is showing Puffer's Pond. The old map's a bit distorted. Uh, the new map isn't much, but you know you can see it's based. Uh, you know there's an aerial image in the in the you know, the outline of the flood hazard area is much more refined following accurate topography. Um, for each, uh, you know, there's usually cross sections done. Sometimes it's noted about what are the actual flood areas. So, um, you know, what are the elevations? And so if a property owner has questions, uh, we can zoom in uh, and look. Here's another area in South Amherst. So, you know, this is showing the, um, you know, here's the West Pomeroy 116 intersection. And you can see all the cross section lines giving elevations and just, you know, before over here, you can see that, you know, there's kind of a nice curvilinear boundary to the flood area, not really following topography. And here it's, you know, it's, it's quite accurate in terms of where the, you know, the flood boundary uh, follows topography. It's also showing the flood way, which is the, you know, the area where there's an actual water course and where that um, there's some elevation in the water here. Um, you know, and as part of this, because it's a, a digital map, you know, we're able to combine it with our other GIS layers and know, you know, more accurately what structures are, you know, in the zone here. And so as part of this process, um, when we had preliminary maps, we did notify all the property owners whose properties were impacted by this uh, to let them know their preliminary maps and that, you know, they could review them. So the current timeline, um, you know, this has been uh, previewed with town council. So, you know, these preliminary maps. Uh, the next step in the process is a letter of final determination from FEMA, uh, which will be issued in late April. And that begins a six month compliance period. So within those six months, the town has to adopt local regulations uh, and that's zoning and an overlay map and the flood study and the flood maps. Um, and the, you know, the town has to do this probably a month before the six month compliance period ends because the state and then FEMA have to review the local regulations to make sure that they're, um, you know, up to standard. So we can't really wait till, you know, five and a half months and, and adopt the regulations. We should really adopt them, you know, with four or five weeks before the compliance period ends. Uh, you know, this really is the final phase. Um, we've already reached out to the state uh, for their, their floodplain coordinator. And so we have a draft bylaw before you that's been, you know, we've met with um, the state twice now and we can continue to meet with them um, just so that, you know, by the time we get to an adoption time, they're familiar with what we're proposing. Uh, the, so, you know, in terms of what's happening next, the, the town council will see this in early April as a zoning amendment and then refer it back to the planning board and CRC for you know, public hearings to actually have an official zoning amendment process. So we're starting it before the letter is issued, knowing that it will be in late April, hopefully giving us a bit more time to review the language of the bylaw. Uh, and there's a few components of the local regulations. The, the flood zone that was shown on those previous slides in blue becomes an overlay zoning district. And so it's not a base zone, it's an overlay district. You know, the FPC is a base zone, right? So this, this zone would go on top of it or other base zoning districts. Um, it would be considered a new section of the bylaw is an easiest way to accommodate what the state and FEMA are asking as opposed to trying to, um, you know, fit certain sections and regulations within the existing bylaw. We're proposing a new section um, it uses standard language. So the draft that's will be looked at tonight and that was in the packet, you know, 97% or, you know, most of the language is really standard language that um, can't be removed. It can be slightly modified. It could be made more stringent, but that's the standard language provided by the state. And the bylaw really needs to have a structure of an intent and purpose, definitions, uh, you know, a floodplain administrator role uh, regulations and enforcement. And so, you know, those sections are required and the definitions that came with the bylaw that are in there are straight from FEMA. Um, so that's that presentation. I can stop there for now if there's any questions and then go to the actual language of the bylaw. So if, if this process is pretty much prescribed by the state and FEMA, mm -hmm. 
and there's not very much opportunity to change anything. Is this going to be, is this controversial in any way? I mean, do we really need six months? Well, um, I think some communities may not have started working on a bylaw until they've actually received the letter of final determination. And so they might actually need six months to develop the language. Uh, some communities decide not to create a discrete section of their bylaw, but try to integrate it into a bylaw. And then it becomes more complicated because, you know, where do you put, you know, filling of water courses or a few regulations and where's the rest of it? Um, so, you know, Waitley is, was going through this process last fall and Hadley has gone through it recently. And they, you know, they did mostly, um, you know, a consolidated section of their zoning. Um, in terms of what could change, you know, for instance, Hadley, Hadley says that, you know, no new single family homes in the overlay. And FEMA doesn't prohibit development, right? So they're saying that it has to follow standards, you know, there's compensatory storage, there's also permitting with the Conservation Commission. So it may be that in the floodplain, you know, the 100 year floodplain, you, um, you could develop, you might have to, you know, maybe costly, it may not be allowed depending on where it is to, to you know, depending on wetlands and other resource areas. So you know, some communities may have, um, you know, put a few more um, conditions or standards in their floodplain, right? So um, FEMA allows the storage of vehicles as long as they're highway ready with certain conditions. Some communities might say absolutely no storage of vehicles in, in this overlay area. Um, and so, you know, I think those are the, the changes. Um, FEMA also requires that there be some type of permit or checklist for any development or project in the floodplain. And so our bylaw is proposing a checklist. Um, most of the work is probably gonna be covered by the Conservation Commission anyways. Uh, there may be some projects that really don't need permitting by the Conservation Commission that may not require a building permit, but say there people are um, stockpiling material or moving things around that may require some review by this, by um, the town. And so, we're proposing a checklist. So that's something that, you know, the planning board could discuss. What is the best way to do that? Is there, you know, we want to issue a separate floodplain permit for every project or the states, the state and FEMA aren't saying that. Um, they're saying that as long as you have some permitting process in place to guide development, that's satisfactory. So we, you know, we're relying on um, our conservation commission, you know, the building inspectors and building commissioner also have to follow FEMA standards when issuing a building permit, knowing a structure is in the floodplain. So, you know, there's probably areas where it could be modified, um, but Doug, to your point, you know, a lot of it is, is, uh, you know, is what they provided for us. Right. And then by adding this chapter 16, if that's the approach we end up with, is there a current process that needs that 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 the regulations for the current process needs to be removed from the zoning code or is is this a brand new thing in the zoning code so this would be if this becomes visible this would become a brand new section so nothing needs to be removed uh, so this is an entirely new process and there's no old regulations to remove so uh within the bylaw there's um, in various sections in section two, uh, there's a few uh, sections in three uh, where we have the flood prone conservancy district where we talk about certain things like, um, you know, land disturbance in a water course area or um, certain things. And so in those sections, we may need to cross reference and just say, you know, see article 16, what we've done here, what we're proposing, if I scroll down here to, um, the regulations, we're just saying that um, that uh, this section should apply, um, um, you know, regardless. So basically, um, you know, right here, the floodplain management regulations here shall take precedence over any less restrictive or conflicting parts of the bylaw. And so, you know, we're hoping that language um, allows us not to go in and tweak some sections. So for instance, in our FPC district, which is a base district, we have standards and conditions in the FPC flood prone conservancy zoning district. We're not proposing to change any of those right now because we think that this, you know, this language right here allows that to remain unchanged. Um, and so, 
you know, we could okay. tweak that language a bit, um, but, you know, we're not really trying to go in and change what we say in the FBC or in other parts of the zoning um, right now. Okay. Uh, Andrew, I saw your hand for a while. Do you want to make, have a question or a comment? Uh, yeah, I, I guess so. Uh, thanks, Doug. Um, it's not process related, it's just on the outcomes. When when the floodplains were redrawn using the, the new technology or the, the new methodology, I should say, um, what what was the change to the old one? Is it did it get bigger, smaller, more structures impacted, less structures impacted? Yeah, I think in the end, um, I think a few hundred structures were taken out of the flood uh, flood area. So I think, I think it was almost three hundred. Um, but you know, in some areas it was expanded, and in some areas um, it was reduced. And so um, I had we have. Uh, we had a map online that showed what was removed and what was um, added. And so, you know, it, it, it varies, um, but. That's good enough. I, I can look online. I, I, I wasn't sure if you know the top of your head, but thanks. Chris. Um, I just wanted to reiterate what Nate said before about um, that we're not touching the flood prone conservancy zone. That is a base zoning district. And if we were to touch that, we would have to decide what goes in its place. Um, and so we may in the future want to look at the flood prone conservancy district, both the um, zoning aspect of it and also the mapping aspect. But right now that is um, overly complicating this project. And so we're uh, not going to do that at this time. I think people get a little confused about the two. So we're going to have these two um, things existing at the same time, but we're not touching FPC. Thank you. All right, Tom. Thanks, Doug. And um, thanks for the presentation, Nate. I guess my question is, you know, as I was reading through this, I'm, I'm just curious, what, what do you need us to do, want us to, what, what are we doing at this time? And I'm looking at your timeline and trying to like fit planning board into there. What are the things we want to be discussing? Can they be highlighted? The things that are flexible that we need to be concerned with? Like what, what's helpful right now or in the next weeks? Sure, that's a really good question. I, you know, when this file I was, um, you know, when we first drafted it, staff first drafted it, you know, there's a few questions. So for instance, we have a, a section that defines the roles of the floodplain administrator. And, you know, we can add in and subtract some of those. Um, I think, you know, it's also important to determine who is that position in town. I think right now we, you know, Chris and I said it could be the planning director or their designee or, you know, or in their absence, the uh, senior planner. So, you know, I mean, minor things, but, um, you know, what happens there, um, you know, if you look at the map showing the overlay area in town, you know, would there be other conditions or regulations you'd want in there that aren't in the bylaw? So, you know, would you want to prohibit certain activities beyond what um, the by, you know, what the bylaw would? Um, you know, I think, you know, I think that. Oh, so are there places in this that we, that can be highlighted, like with mm -hmm. questions or prompts for us sure. to like have discussions in the future, like where we can debate some of those? Because I feel like I read it and I kind of understood what it was doing, but I wasn't sure what our role, like what, where we can actually start to make evaluations. And I think as someone, as maybe it was Doug who said, is this really controversial? And if so, <laughs> yeah. where would it be controversial and how can we address that now? Sure. Yeah, no, we can do that. I think some of it was just to make the planning board aware that this is, you know, will be brought forward in the next month, just so, you know, it's not a complete surprise yeah. when you hear that, you know, there's a zoning amendment to add a floodplain. Um, well, really but district. can I, um, you know, frequently we talk for, for months <laughs> about proposed bylaws before they ever go to town council. And when they go to town council, it starts a timeline for a bunch of things to happen. Um, should we be starting that timeline now? And is this purely to make sure we hit the six month deadline? Chris? So what I would say is that this is the opening of a conversation about this project. 
and I think it makes sense for us to um, bring back refined drafts of the um, zoning bylaw. Nate had a number of questions that we need to answer internally and with our uh, advisors from the state and from AECOM. Um, and we didn't want to bring those questions to you because that would have complicated things. But um, certainly as we revise this, I think it makes sense to keep bringing it back and you know, perhaps at some meeting to show you more about what the maps actually show um, with regard to you know, North Amherst or particular areas that might be developed in the future um, so that you really get a feeling for it because you know, it, is, it is a big project and it is complicated. I don't think it's that controversial, although a question has come up recently about why um, the center of town is not on the map. And you know, if you look at these maps online, you'll see that there's kind of a carve out in the center. Um, and we've talked to AECOM about that and they've told us that um, that area doesn't rise to the level of um, needing to be mapped according to FEMA because it's, I think it's below, what is it, a half mile? Um, Watershed, I think that's right, Nate. Nate may correct me, but um, in any event, that is something that you know people are going to be asking about, especially people who live in that area. Um, those people are able to buy flood insurance now, and they'll be able to buy flood insurance in the future, whether or not their property is mapped. But they're going to have questions about that. So we want to be able to answer people's questions. So I think it makes sense to not not just put this on a shelf until it's referred to you for a public hearing, but to, you know, continue to talk about it and continue to uh, answer your questions. And perhaps there will be questions from the public as well. Okay, thanks, Chris. Uh, Janet. Um, I have a couple of questions and, and I, I think I need sort of like to step back and I, to understand um, the flood prone conservancy district and where it is in Amherst, um, the relationship between that, the FEMA flood overlay zone. And then, you know, when I saw that map from Janet Keller and it, on the Mitchell farm, it said floodplains. And, you know, I don't see Mitchell farm uh, as a flood, play, flood conservancy district on this big map that I have of the town. And so I'm just kind of lost a little bit, like how do all these things relate to each other? Like if Mitchell Farm is a floodplain, but it's not in floodplain conservancy and doesn't show up on the FEMA map, I just don't understand that. But I'd, I'd love to know a little bit more about the flood conservancy district and how they all relate. Then when we get to the bylaw, I would love to see how Article 16 interacts with our current bylaw, where there's overlapping points or maybe points of, you know, how that how that works. So that's that's kind of my first thing. Like, what are we, you know, why, why are these things different or how are they different? And why is Mitchell Farm listed as a floodplain and doesn't seem to show up anywhere else? Um, I also know that map, I think, I don't know if that came out of the Conservation Commission or it came out of the, de uh, the developers or, I don't know. So that's my first question or comment. Sure, I was just gonna share a screen. So if, if, if this is visible, so, you know, what's shown in blue here is the areas that are mapped as the new, you know, flood hazard area. And, you know, that's, you know, so there's say there's 25 miles of, of stream in Amherst. 10 of those were a uh, detailed study in the eighties and there are detailed study again, which means there are field surveys to verify, you know, uh, structures, road crossings, elevations. Um, 10 miles were um, redelineated using, you know, the new regression equation and automation and computer modeling. So they, was, they weren't field surveys and then five miles were, um, they never were detailed studied and they weren't now and they were just you know, redrawn again using accurate topography. So you know, interestingly, the FPC was adopted in the early seventies and was based on a number of things. It was also you know, somewhat based on flooding but it has other purposes. So in some areas, the FPC is broader and bigger you know, in geographic extent than the flood uh, hazard area in some areas it's smaller you know sometimes they say it's just 75 feet from the from uh, you know the the bank and at the time i don't think um you know amherst had an it was it predates the firm it predates the flood maps and so really the fbc was amherst being 
you know, progressive at trying to say, okay, we have a natural resource area, let's protect it. Um, but some of the, you know, boundaries look like they were where they were drawn, they were political, right? Or maybe a property owner didn't want to be in it. Um, in some areas it goes uphill and clearly flooding doesn't reach there. So I think, you know, they, it was done using the best data that was available in the early seventies. Um, and this is more accurate. Staff did look at it and the difficulty is as a base zone, if we were to, you know, there's overlapping here, but there's so many, so many areas, so many small areas where the FPC and this don't align, it'd be very difficult to change the FPC without changing, you know, all the adjacent zoning districts, um, right? So to make this an overlay works, but we can generate a map, but I think it's gonna be, you know, the real reason is the FPC is a base zone that to change that is, is really complicated because it touches, you know, so much else. So is it right to say that you're, for right now, you want to just get this in place so that we have met the state and federal requirements? And, and that paragraph that you put in said, this thing supersedes any other conflicts. Right. Um, so that you just get this done now. And then whether it's in a year or five years, you come back and fix the FPC. We could, right. I mean, what if you just threw it out? So, right, so if that's, so if that's a possibility, so I'm just gonna zoom in quickly here to North Amher. So in this area right here, right? So the FPC might, it comes a little bit over here, right? In this U shape, it, this area is FPC. Well, this side of the road is one zoning district. Over here, it's another zoning district. So if we were to move FPC and there's this little gap here, what does this become? What, what zoning district? You know, there's two different zoning districts that are encompassed by the FPC right here. And so does one half of the road side become commercial and the other half become residential? I mean, th there, there is probably, you know, hundreds or thousands of that where this new boundary and FPC don't align very well. So I think it becomes a much bigger project to say, well, what, let's get rid of the FPC. Um, the FPC also has some conditions and regulations in it that might be more strict than what FEMA does or doesn't allow. So then we'd have to consider, would we want to take some of those conditions and put them in you know, this FEMA overlay? Also, may I, may I say something? Oh, sure. Um, so I want to look at this map and go up north a bit. And I'd like to say that I did not, um, how can I say, uh, curate what uh, Janet Keller sent to you. I just sent it to you. So there may be some misunderstandings on her part about what is and what isn't shown on maps. This map clearly shows that parts of the Mitchell farm are in the floodplain. So the floodplain pretty much goes all the way from, um, you know, very close to Coles Road, very much, uh, you know, near Coles Road, and it goes all the way up to the Sunderland line. So, and Mitchell Farm is somewhere in there. Mitchell Farm is actually just east of Sunderland Road. You can see Sunderland Road going up north and then intersecting with um, Route 116. And if Nate would move his little hand or whoever's got this little hand, yeah, that's the intersection of 116. So Mitchell Farm is to the east of that. And you can see that this whole area is blue. So it's clear that Mitchell Farm is included in this floodplain. So I'm, I'm not sure what point um, Jana Keller was trying to get across. I felt um, obligated to send you the information that she had sent me. But as I said, I hadn't curated it or looked at it or figured out you know, what, what she was actually trying to say. So I would encourage um, planning board members who are really interested in this and um, want to get into the nitty gritty details to make an appointment to come in and meet with me and Nate, and we would be happy to meet with you individually, or, you know, we could probably meet with two of you at a time, and we would be happy to, you know, scroll through the maps and go through, you know, the process that we um, went through to get here. Um, it's really important to get this set of maps approved by the end of the six month period. If we don't, the town will be out of the um, flood insurance um, program. So, you know, we've been working on this since, as I said, you know, for 10 years. Um, 
we think we've got a pretty good set of maps here. And if people are really interested in getting into the details, we're happy to meet with you and talk to you about the details. We can also, um, we will be calling in our AECOM uh, technical expert or consultant um, to you know, attend uh, the meeting with the town council. And then again, to attend the CRC public hearing and the planning board public hearing. So she'll be able to answer questions. Um, as I said, we're not trying to change anything about the FPC. We understand that the FPC is a, um, near and dear to many people's hearts. And so we felt that it was not appropriate to try to change that at this time. We're just adopting these FEMA maps to replace the FEMA maps that we've had since 1983. So I don't want anybody to be fearful that we're somehow trying to um, change something in, in the FPC zone, because that is not true at this time. Um, and again, I encourage you to call us and come in and meet with us and we'll show you the maps and go through the process and, and try to make things as clear as possible. Thanks. I think right. just Thanks. quickly to Andrew's point of seeing what's changed, we had an interactive online map that showed, you know, what's, what's being added and what's being removed compared to the old maps. And when, you know, we've gone a few years of getting updated preliminary maps. And so IT hasn't, um, hasn't, you know, done that. I guess it's a fair amount of work. And so, you know, there's been discussions about getting that back online again, just so anyone could go there and we could, you know, it could be part of a presentation too, to see, okay, you know, these areas in red are being removed, here's in green are being added, and then here's what stays the same. And so we had kind of three categories and it was a really great visual to see the changes around town and it was an online uh, map. And so that's something that, you know, we can talk about trying to get going. So I think it would really help the presentation to see that. Well, even if you just had a map that had the two boundaries, one in blue and one in yellow, you know, then people could interpret what's removed and added themselves. And I, you know, your IT people would just drop in the two layers. So, Janet. So I would, I would appreciate sort of you know, piggybacking on what Tom said to know, you know, what are the key issues for us to discuss. And I'd also like to have, I don't know, a, a chart or something about how Article 16 would interact with the flood current regulations. And I read it that um, we can have regulations that are more stringent, but if they're less stringent, then the, um, the federal rules apply. And so it's not like it, it supersedes it. It's just sort of like, it's making sure you're not going below that threshold. So I would love to see some way to understand how they interact with ha having to like hunt and peck. Um, and then getting back to the draft, because I've never seen this before. I went, I remember going to something about these flood maps like two and a half years ago that were super detailed with the consultant. But this draft is like a based on the model the state is giving out and other towns have adapted it and use this as sort of a template. Is that where it comes from? Yeah, the state uh, office provides it. So this is actually their newest template. And um, I say the draft that was in the packet has a little bit more detail, you know, section um, on local permitting has a little bit more. So this really is, uh, has everything that they've asked for and a little bit more. So I don't, you know, in terms of communities adding more detail, it may be that, um, you know, they wanted to put a lot more in there, but this really, you know, this is everything that the state's provided in terms of a, a template. And then a qu another a question. So if I was, if I had a house in the floodplain or near it and I wanted to put a garage on or something like that, I would have to go through the article 16 process and an FPC process or are they doing both at the same time? Do you know, is there, you know, am I getting one kind of permit and then also getting a special permit or a site, you know what I mean? Like what's- right. So the, the flood maps aren't, um, you know, it's in zoning uh, in part because that's what I think the, um, you know, it's, it's, it, there's some land use there associated with it and the overlay is a geographic um, overlay, but the, the flood mapping themselves, there's, you know, uh, we have our permitting in place. So whether it's through the conservation commission or FPC that would guide what happens with say that garage. And so we're not trying to add another permit step um, we just have to have some documentation that any project that happens in the floodplain follows permitting. Um, okay. 
And then, you know, what it would mean though, is as a homeowner or property owner, do you need flood insurance on that structure? So, you know, then that becomes a discussion with, you know, if you're taking out a mortgage with the bank or the lender, you know, are you required to get flood insurance? And so, um, you know, right now it may be that the maps are so old, if your property is somewhat close, to, you know, if there's the flood boundary is somewhat close to a structure, they could say you, you're required to have it. And now you might be able to go to the bank and say, look, these are, you know, updated using, you know, the, this newest technology, it's going to be out of the floodplain. And you could kind of make the case that you don't need to have, you, you're not required to purchase flood insurance and you still could do it optionally. And it would be much cheaper because you're not required to. So. Um, okay. Thanks, Nate. Um, so I guess uh, you don't really need any action from us tonight. So we could just say thank you for giving us a preview of what will be coming back to us with a request for a public hearing at some point in the not too distant future, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think that um, the town council is going to give us, you know, a long time before we have to schedule a public hearing. I don't think they're going to ask you to schedule a public hearing very soon. They're probably going to give you the full 90 days that they often do give. But I think it would be worthwhile for us as we work through this and talk to our state rep um, that we bring it back, you know, when we make changes. And it's worthwhile to um, talk about how this relates to the FPC. But again, we're not changing the FPC. One of the things that is going to be different about this is that um, the FPC doesn't allow you to build a house in the 100-year floodplain. Um, FEMA would allow you to build a house in the 100-year floodplain. You just have to put it up on stilts. So um, you know the differences are pretty noticeable. Um, and we can talk about that if you want to talk about it. But the FPC is, is pretty strict in some ways and um you know it's probably stricter than than the fema um, model bylaw or the state model bylaw and you know and that's part of the what should i say uh difficulty of trying to do both at the same time we don't want to do both at the same time that would really um stall us in our tracks but we're happy to talk about what the differences are okay thank you and um, thanks nate for the presentation um, I guess we're finished with that item. So the next, the time now is 8.58 and we'll go on to item five in our agenda. Can I Eight. make a, um, a suggestion? Sure, I have Chris. Gabrielle Gould on the, um, on her laptop and she's willing to talk to you about rapid recovery plan, which she helped to, um, develop. Um, and I think she probably doesn't want to stay through hearing about fees for public hearing legal ads. So I wondered if we could have Gabrielle come on and um, I'll send her a text and say that you're ready for her. How about that? Okay, so, we can jump to item six, rapid recovery plan. Okay, so the last time you saw the rapid recovery plan was um, uh, two weeks ago. I think, yeah. isn't mm -hmm. that right? Um, and you saw, or do you have- we saw, the, we saw the executive summary, I think. That's right, yeah. And then you asked for um, the Dodson Flinker portion of it to come back. And um, let me see if Gabrielle is coming into the, no, she's not. Um, in any event- um, Well, you had, you, you had sent the entire document to us back in, Late February, February. Yeah. I think it was the 24th. So we've all had it for a while. Um, and you brought the executive summary to us last meeting. And mm -hmm. then I, I had found the Dodson and Flinker comments to be interesting, just as, a, you know, another person who's reading the bylaw. Mm -hmm. And um, so I thought it was worth discussing here. And I wondered whether Chris and you and your staff had discussed it just because there were some sort of opinions about the legibility of some of it and the complexity. And, you know, Tom, uh, there was some discussion about how the DRB requirements are kind of vague. So, you know, would we want to suggest that they be tightened up? And 
are any of these observations something we would want to act on? Is really all I'm kind of wondering. So you probably know that some of these things have been acted on already, right? I mean, you could probably glean that from reading the um, Dodson Flinker section. Well, they certainly did allude to some of the things that were in process when they were doing their work. Gabrielle is logging on now. So. <laughs> she, she didn't want to attend the whole meeting because she had to deal with things having to do with her family. And I totally understand that. Um, so do you want to bring up the Dodson Flinker section on the, uh, on the screen and start talking about it one by one? Or how do you want to manage this? Sure. I mean, there's probably five pages of it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we could we could scroll through it and just see if there's things that people want to talk about. Um, has 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 the board looked at it sufficiently to have things that you found interesting and wanted to talk about or not? All right, so. I guess I do want to make sure I'm not the only one that thought this was interesting. Because if I am, we can just keep going. <laughs> Andrew. I, I, I also thought it was interesting. Um, and I was generally encouraged from it, right? Like I was expecting something that would maybe have been um, a little bit more critical, but it seemed like, you know, the, the general tone was, you know, it's pretty well organized. We seem to be pretty systematic, but there are some areas which could use some clarity. And that, you know, I think that that's not surprising. Okay. Excuse me. I noticed that um, Gabrielle is in the attendees, and I wondered if Pam could bring her over. Excuse me. Um, I can, but not at the same time. I share my screen. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. So, Nate do you want me to? Or, you want me to do Nate, it? Yep. Yeah, that would be great um promote to panelists correct all right gabrielle we think we've made you a panelist good evening everybody how are you we're well thank you thanks for joining us yeah so maybe gabrielle could give us a few words about how this came to be how this report came to be and what the bid um, intends to do with it. And then, you know, you could ask her questions and we could talk about what these um, zoning changes, you know, how we can manage these zoning changes or what we've already done and what we still need to do. Absolutely. So um, the bid applied for this grant through the state and was awarded uh, the, the, the grant opportunity to work with Civic Moxie, who put this lovely uh, package together for us. We worked with them for several months. They came to Amherst several times. Um, as you can see, if you go through, they worked with um, town manager Paul Bosselman, um, some of our major stakeholders, um, some of our major um, uh, cultural and art directors and uh, community members to uh, bring us a pretty comprehensive and remarkable uh, package here. Uh, they were really a joy to work with. So much of this, especially when you're looking at the Dodson and Flinker uh, notice in front of you, has already been addressed and we are accomplishing and the town has accomplished and, and your group has accomplished. Uh, you, our hope is to continue working with this plan and to continue growing with this plan. Um, again, uh, to uh, second what one of you said earlier, there, there was a lot of positive, uh, an incredible amount of positive, and you know, then some really great constructive criticism. Where we intend to go with this is looking at all the project recommendations and seeing what we, where we've come, uh, what we have left to do, and how do we undertake these and try and make good on all 10 projects, which would be fantastic. Uh, there's going to be funding out there that we think that we and alongside the town can go with. Uh, we've already been, uh, um, awarded a grant um, from the Redo grant. Uh, the town of Amherst and the bid co-sponsored that grant. We were the only town to be awarded uh, exactly what we asked for because it was so comprehensive and strong and followed these recommendations. So we're looking forward to seeing how we can keep going forward with this. Okay, thank you, Gabrielle. And I, I hope you'll stay with us while we 
talk about uh, Dodson and Flinker. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Um, so Pam, um, do you think you could scroll down just a little bit to the bullet points? Um, yeah, there, that, whoops, 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 whoops. At the bottom of the first page there. Just, there you go. All right. Yes. Yeah. All right, so, there you go. all right. Um, so mixed use buildings, challenges of obtaining a special permit, music and entertainment in particular, lack of specificity of some of our requirements, parking garage, apartment units, caps, and the BL district. Um, Chris, uh, you know, some of those things we've We've worked on the mixed use building that, and we, we did the overlay for the parking garage. Um, we've talked about apartment buildings. We've talked about the BL. Uh, do you think any of those things are likely to be coming back to us any, this year or they're not really on your priority list? I don't know, but if I had to guess, I would think that the apartment building might come back. Um, we don't yet know what the CRC and town council's um, priorities are. It's, it wasn't on our list, but it might be on their list. Mm -hmm. um, we've, done, we've taken a step uh, towards um, eliminating a barrier for the parking garage. Um, we are still um, asking for money from the capital fund to look at the Boltwood garage to see if it, you know, can accommodate a second or third floor, but no one has stepped forward to say that they would like to pay for that. So, so that may be um, a concern there. Um, the design review handbook, we know that that needs to be redone. In fact, Nate worked on redoing it, I think back in 20, 2009, I believe. So it's about time to redo it. Um, and some of the challenges with regard to special permits have been dealt with in the short run via Article 14. Um, there is a proposal to make some of those changes permanent so that some of the things that have required special permits in the past would no longer require special permits, but that's something that um, Rob Mora is working on with Maureen Pollock and will be bringing to the CRC at some point, but it hasn't, they haven't really drafted anything yet. So, um, and then in terms of the first bullet here with regard to ground floor commercial requirements for mixed use buildings, I think when that was initially proposed a number of years ago, we had a percentage of 60% of commercial space in mixed use buildings um, that was proposed. That amendment wasn't adopted, but more recently we have adopted a proposed, um, proposed zoning amendment that required 30% of the ground floor to be a non-residential use. So I think you know we've, we've taken care of that at least in the short run. So that, that would be it for the first um, page. We're, we're not really, looking at BL right now, unless um, the CRC or town council asks us to. Okay, Maria, something you wanted to? Yeah, the, um, Chris, was there a, a funding or ongoing um, form-based zoning study for downtown that was happening? And I wonder if some of this could fold into that. Like, what, was that something I imagined? <laughs> no, we do have $100,000 to um, work on either form-based zoning or design standards, which is what we're calling it now. And we're pretty well along with writing an RFP mm -hmm. for the design standards. And we will be bringing it to the planning board for review um, once we feel comfortable with it. I think Nate and I have met with the town manager and the assistant town manager about it, um, but we wanna make some tweaks before we bring it to the planning board. But that mm -hmm. will um, certainly influence what would be allowed what can be done in the downtown, but I think it's going to make it a more cohesive place once we have those standards in place. It'll be easier for people to figure out, you know, what it is the town wants before it gets into a permitting process. Right, I think that bullet point one and maybe three and possibly the last one, those might 
be part of that study, you know, the sort of more specificity for the design review board, because they only covered the downtown, right? And then the BLBG might be in there, and as well as the ground floor commercial. So maybe some, <clears throat> some of this can be covered by that sort of study. Yep. All right, thanks, Maria. Um, Janet. So I have a question for Chris and one for Gabrielle. Chris, is, is the town moving ahead for an RFP on the North Prospect Street garage, or is it going to wait to look at other sites or um, answer the questions about um, the Bangs garage? That's question one. Uh, I would say at this time, the town is not moving ahead with an RFP for the garage. Um, that decision has not been made, but we are asking for um, funds to look at the Boltwood garage because I think people keep bringing that up. Mm -hmm. So we need to answer that question and you know either put it to bed or decide that Boltwood has some merit and we should look further. Um, that's really more of a structural study uh, rather than a feasibility study, but at least it'll answer the question, does Ken Boltwood actually support another floor or two? Um, so the answer to your first question, are we moving ahead with an RFP is not at this time. Okay, and, and then my question for Gabrielle um, was about um, the challenges in obtaining a special permit, especially related to uses in, in live entertainment and um, music. So I, I would, I'm always interested in like what problems people are having. And so I was interested in like, has that been a problem? Um, was it a problem, you know, like in the past? Cause I, I just don't know. Yeah, article for, oh, sorry. Um, article 14 has definitely helped address a lot of the struggles that businesses have when they are coming into a space that needs to be rezoned or, or looked at differently. I think the biggest issue with going from a, a, a quote unquote normal restaurant to more of a music venue or a nightclub venue was that it, it is considered a zoning change. Um, so it had to go through all of the steps when really, when you think about it, it's adding two hours to uh, an existing liquor license or, or business. And, um, you know, basically, if it's in a non-residential area, like the lit space or what is going to be the Drake soon, it just, it, it becomes cumbersome to do all of that extra paperwork and all of that extra. It can take three months. And for a small business owner or someone trying to start something from nothing, you know, with their savings account and their dreams, that is, that can be the end of any small business. So um, again, Article 14 is addressing so much of that and if the town council continues to go forward with article 14 and some of the you know things that have been put forward during the pandemic it'll be a really great step into uh sort of recouping the reputation that amherst is the hardest place to do business or to open a business all right uh jack yeah i, I you know since we have gabriel here um <laughs> I just wanted to like give her so much, you know, credit and kudos for everything she's done for Amherst, you know, downtown area. Her vision has has been amazing, and uh, you know the her you know the proposal for the Drake and making that happen is just what this you know what Amherst needs. And I just wanted to you know thank you know Gabrielle and at this time, <laughs> since I can. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. Really yeah. appreciate it. OK, Jack. Chris. I just wanted to clarify something, that um, these music venues don't really require a change to zoning. What they require is a special permit, which allows okay. them to do something that's not ordinarily or normally allowed in the district, and that is by um, the Zoning Board of Appeals takes a look at it and decides what kinds of conditions need to be placed on things. But it's really not the same as a zoning, a change in zoning, because that requires um, town council vote. And so I just wanted to clarify that. Thanks. OK, thanks, Chris. All right. All right. Uh, maybe, Pam, maybe scroll up to the scroll, scroll to mm -hmm. the top of the second page. All right, um, anything in here anybody wants to talk about? I thought the zoning map PDF file 
observation that it was difficult to interpret. It might be something that planning staff might want to think about. So may I say something about that? Sure. Yeah, so we rarely use that PDF map and I'm thinking maybe we shouldn't even have it. It is very hard to read and very confusing. What we rely on is the GIS web map, which is um, referred to in the second um, sentence of that paragraph. And that map is actually pretty easy to read and pretty user friendly. So we might want to just ditch the PDF. The reason we have it is so that if somebody wants a map to go along with their zoning bylaw, they can carry it away with them in their you know, briefcase. But it really isn't that helpful in um, determining exactly what your zoning situation is, particularly with regard to downtown. So that's something maybe Nate and I can talk about that offline with the building commissioner about whether we want to keep that PDF map. All right. Uh, well, I, I think that was the, the map that Janet sort of picked up and flashed earlier in the meeting. Oh. Um, and I know I have a copy and I do look at it every now and then. So uh, I think there is some value to being able to print out a, a complete picture of the town and its zoning districts. Andrew. Yeah, I was, uh, I was trying to remember that PDF. Is it, I wasn't sure if the, I guess one, is it black and white? Right. No, yeah. that's oh, okay. And then I just wasn't sure if that cartography was like ADA compliant or something like that. Right. And I guess not that it's necessarily ADA, but if it's if it's designed in a manner for sight impaired. But if not, then yeah, I I, I agree it's pretty ugly. Okay. Um, why don't you scroll down, Pam? Get to the lower half of page two. That's good. Um, I thought the comment about the 55 foot building height and with five stories, you know, I think most of the recent tall buildings that are on the north end of town, we have given them uh, zoning variances uh, for a couple of extra feet. And so, you know, it might be worth adjusting that 55 to 58 or 60 or something just to reduce the number of special permits that we have to do or that we think we want to do. Um, and the Nate. Sure. Thanks, Doug. Um, you know, right, you know, previously with the bullets, you know, as Chris mentioned, the, the RFP, we're hoping to have, you know, a team look at, you know, the downtown and come up with the uh, design standards. And so, you know, as part of that, I, you know, I'm hopeful that they would come up with what are the right heights, you know, what are the right setbacks. And, you know, even for instance, we don't define mechanical equipment and other things on a rooftop as being um, part of the height of the building, but then people put screening on. So the effective height is taller. So, you know, you know, I'd like to think that during this, this downtown design standard process, you know, all those things are discussed, you know, do we redefine the height of a building to include those or not? Or if so, are they stepped back from, from view? And what is the right height for a five-story building? What is the right setback on a sidewalk? Um, you know, I'm hoping then it addresses density, maybe on a per acre or per square foot basis. And then they say, here's what you'd want in the BL areas. And maybe it's no longer BL, but it's something else, but it really does get into all of that. What does it look like? What is the density? What is, and then, you know, then it's really the, the town's um, response is how do we adopt it as zoning? And do we then change, you know, the permitting path uh, if it complies with these standards? Um, so, that, that, and then one other thing is the zoning map, you know, a number of years ago, the town, meeting officially adopted the online GIS as our official zoning map. So the paper copies are, you know, for reference and for people who may want them They're they should be printed on 24 by 36 sheets to be even somewhat legible. And then, but really the, the online GIS is our official zoning map. So if people do call the second floor and ask, we direct them to the web GIS just so they can zoom in more and get a better picture of a property. Um, that's it. Great, great, thanks. All right, maybe Janet. So 
I don't know how this fits in, but I, I think that um, I'm not sure that we'll be able to address it through a design or a form-based zoning process, but we're a college town and, and, and you know, downtown we have some, um, you know, subsidized housing and, you know, we have low-income people, we have elders, and then most of the people living downtown um, are students. And I, I just, you know, I, I kind of felt this way with the rapid recovery report Port is, you know, that the impact of students positive and negative, and you know where should students go? Do we want the downtown to be primarily for student housing? Um, what impact that has on businesses? Do we want to encourage more year-round residents and um, maybe people with a little more cash in their pocket? You know, so you know, you know, a year-round resident who you know will spend you know twelve months of the year, not seven, and so I don't know. I keep on wondering, like, you know, we have people, you know, students come in and party every Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night, you know, and when we're talking about that really lovely housing development that Barry Roberts is doing, people are drunken students, hundreds are walking down Fearing Street at night, and is that going to be a family project, you know, like, this issue, um, good, bad, I, it, you know, I wonder how we can address this issue in our zoning code, and so to me, a lot of the downtown issues are, we want the downtown for everybody. We wanna broaden the retail base, um, what people are you know, bringing tourists in and not just you know, students living downtown. I, I was at a um, meeting with a bunch of people who all lived in homes and you know, older women and they all wanted, would love to live downtown and get rid of their big houses, freeing them up for others. But there, isn't, there aren't places to buy downtown or places to rent downtown. And, you know, the, biz, the large buildings that have come in are primarily student housing. And so do we want to continue on that path or do we want a, a different mix? You know, as the master plan calls, you know, all the neighborhoods should be mixed. And so that issue isn't here, but I feel like it's sort of like the elephant in the room. And I wonder how we can address it, maybe not through this process, but we need to address it, I think, in a planning process. Okay, Jan. Or community Thanks. consensus process. Yeah. I guess I will I will comment that it's not clear to me what the mix of students versus 12 month people is in the large buildings that we have uh, that have been erected in the last few years, and I suspect it varies from year to year. And I think um, it's primarily students. Well, I I know I hear you. I, I I just don't know that I know where you get that information. And certainly when we've asked the developer, he was like, "This is available to anybody that wants to come rent." But so um, he also said it was students in one. I don't remember it that way, but yeah. anyway, um, Gabrielle. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I just, I, I wanted to address a couple of things, Janet, that you said. Um, I understand that you think it's primarily students. Uh, I don't know many people in this area because we moved here and it went into a lockdown, but I do know three young families with children who are living in that building. And I figure if I know that many, then there have to be a lot more. Right now, part of our mission is to build downtown as a destination, uh, a driver with arts and culture that bring people to this area as tourists, as people who spend money. But I'd also like to refute the idea that bringing people downtown who are year round residents and who have quote unquote money in their pocket. Uh, I can tell you right now, Henyon Bakery and Paul Shoe Repair would not be there if it weren't for those two buildings down at the North End, I think it's North. Um, they, uh, a lot of these students and especially the students and graduate students that I know that are living in some of those apartments, plus the families, plus some of the professors, faculty and uh, community members, they have plenty of money in their pocket and they are downtown and they are spending money. And one of the, only silver lining that I can really point to of COVID is that it showed us what our downtown looks like without our student population, without our, without our faculty and without our uh, college administration and university administration. And it's an 80% loss. Uh, I kept shopping, I kept eating out. I live here year round, I have money in my pocket and it still does not equate to a thriving, vibrant and vital downtown. We are a college town. And if we have apartments that students want to live in and are part of our down community, I see them as part of our community. I see them every day on downtown. I see them eating, I see them getting coffee, I see them going out for dinner. And yes, we do have the students who come in to go to the bars at night, 
Um, nobody else is downtown from 8.30 to about 10.30 on. So that's probably the only livelihood that's coming into the, into the town. And I also wanna put a shout out to UMass for their Walk This Way program and all the programming that they're doing to sort of help staunch that late night, loud, rowdy, you know, flow that you were talking about. Thank you. All right, thanks, Gabrielle. Jack. Hey, um, I, I don't know. I just I feel like we need to elevate uh, the status of the students again uh, in what they do for our town. And again, my daughter, you know, goes to UNH and Durham, New Hampshire, and the way Durham integrates with UNH, you know, in that lo locality, they welcome students and um, you know, characterization of the drunken students. Uh, really irritates me. Um, I think we need to welcome, you know, our colleges and, 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 uh, you know, ask them to do, you know, more Amherst College, you know, UMass, and bring them closer to downtown and, and make it more accessible. I mean, it's, it's just, it's just common sense. And uh, I'm done with, you know, like, you know, making students a lower class <laughs> as, 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 you know, has been depicted by some, some of uh, people on the board. So um, I think we can do better, you know, and I think we need to welcome, you know, what we have and integrate uh, what the, what Amherst has. It's, it's amazing. We have, you know, we've all, we have all these colleges and it seems like we're, you know, putting our hands up blocking and saying no, 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 and and you know and the fact is, <laughs> we need to integrate that culture, you know, into our downtown better. And and again, uh, I have to you know commend Gabrielle with all her efforts in the bid and and in and uh, making you know progress in that area. So um, thank you. Okay, thanks, Jack. Uh, Janet, uh, one more comment about page two, and then maybe we'll move on to page three. So, so the elephant in the room is controversial, and, and it's the majority of our residents in town. And not only do I like college students, I had to. I had an Amherst College student staying with me for four years over holidays. Um, but I think that it's obvious that, you know, they need to be in the conversation too. And so I don't know, you know, like, you know, what do they want? What do they want to see? Um, obviously, there's issues of student behavior. I, I actually have talked to somebody who lives at One East Pleasant Street, who was a graduate student, who said it's mostly undergraduates. I would never have lived here if I had known that. I'm just staying on because my thing is over in a year. These, you know, so I think that our downtown planning process or a consensus process has to include students. And it has to include residents and the people who, you know, there are people who live downtown and next to it. And let's like come to some agreement about what we want the downtown to be. And this is what I think Flinker is saying that I found so encouraging. And I just felt like the voice of students was missing as well as, you know, the people who live with students and work with students. And then it definitely we need a year round economy downtown. I mean, if it's empty when everybody leaves, there, if we had more people living downtown, more residents, then we'd have more you know, vitality for the missing months. Um, so I do think we have to talk about this issue and with the people who are directly involved, you know, including the students themselves. All right, thanks, Janet. Pam, why don't we go on to page three? All right. Um... So the one, the one in the third paragraph at the end, the suggestion that maybe townhouses and apartments might be more encouraged in the BL area. So that, that seemed something for conversation. And then there was the conversation in the next paragraph about the apartments and the cap on those. And that's certainly been in conversation already. Why don't you go on down, Pam? Uh, this next one is mixed use, and we've talked and acted on mixed use. Uh, 
Um, this was a point of lack of clarity. Chris, do you think we've, is this any clearer than it was when they did their review? Um, yes, uh, we've totally redone the mixed use building um, bylaw. Okay. And so the difference between the way it is uh, in the comm district and other districts is no longer there. Okay, all right, great. So Pam, go on, go on down, site plan review. Uh, and then we've talked some about live entertainment already and how that has evolved. Uh, special permits don't seem onerous. Design review. Tom, have you found the design review handbook to be lacking or in need of more definition, or do you think they would be helpful? I do, and I think the form-based design process that we're going through is gonna be really helpful. I mean, I think the issue we're running into is that um, what we're being asked to look at are sort of hyper-specific, this little sign and that little sign, and everyone has a little opinion about this little sign, and that creates a kind of bottleneck. It's not so much that, uh, there's no rules for what would be approved or not approved, like the way the zoning specifies a sign size. You can have a maximum of this and you know so on. There's nothing in the guidelines that says a sign has to be this or say this or look like that. So I think what, what they're getting at is that you're just getting launched opinions and there, therefore there's revisions from those opinions, but there's not clarity about what the objectives are for that. So I, I think some set of standards about what we want to see downtown. And it, again, it's gonna be aesthetic. It's gonna be something that might be controversial, but I do think we need to find a way to make it easier for some of these projects to to kind of breeze through as long as they check certain boxes as opposed to you know people commenting on type styles and i'm in, i'm i love to comment on type that's what i do but i also can see how it just holds up the process so um so anyway i see both sides of it i mean where we are now that's the standard that's the process but um i would like to see something a bit more structured um in those design guidelines. Okay. All right, Pam, why don't you scroll on down to six? We'll try to get this done. Uh, go to the conclusion there. Um, all right, seems like we've talked about most of these things. All right, anything else people want to highlight about these? Gabrielle. We wanted to follow up with Tom on the DRB. Um, when it's a great, when it's a strong group and you know it, it is opinions and it's, it, that, that can work and it's almost like an hour of free small business advice uh, for the small businesses. Um, but when it becomes an opinion on set, design or, or font or word mark versus this, um, opinions of, of one or two individuals shouldn't dictate someone's you know, ability to do business or have a sign or create something with, with you know, their, their, their ideas in mind. So I think the design review board, if, if they had, I don't wanna say more stringent, but, but more, you know, okay, I don't particularly like that color, but it's within our color wheelhouse. You know, oh, I, I like serif fonts, but you're doing a, a sans serif. And, you know, that type of thing would be really helpful for small businesses um, because if, at, at, you know, you can picture that if you have three people who just don't like something, they can vote something down. And it, it really isn't supposed to be just a certain person's opinion. It should be something that is, tangible and something that you can check the, the book and say my signage or my this meets all of these standards I know what I'm going in for and yes I can hear opinions and it's great to hear people say I don't think that can be read from here and that's an important thing for small businesses to know but when it's just opinion based that can get really cumbersome and especially when you're a small business and you're trying to build something and you're sitting there listening to like an hour and a half of like 
commentary of opinions. So um, I, I really actually appreciate what the Design Review Board is doing for small businesses. I think it's a, it's a really great service in a lot of ways, but I think there can be tightening of it so that there is that checklist that says this is where we are. Okay, thanks, Gabrielle. Nate. Sure, thanks, Doug. The, um, you know, I think, I was gonna say a few things, you know, in the memo they did mention parking and we have the municipal parking district. And I think at, you know, at some point that's, you know, staff has said, you know, do we need to re-examine that, you know, um, you know, in terms of what's necessary for resident parking or visitor parking, what are the standards for parking? We have changed the bylaw a little bit, but I think, you know, there's still the municipal parking district. Um, number four, that's visible on the screen, you know, staff looked at, um, you know, um, Article 14, and then, you know, there's been some discussion about trying to make some of those things permanent. Um, when I see number four here, what we don't have uh, is, a, you know, definitions for certain types of uses. So, you know, right now, if you want to be a nightclub or something, maybe you're a rest, you're a class two restaurant, but, you know, what, what the building commissioner and staff have said is maybe we need um, another use category or two for certain things, even what they're, you know, they're showing here. Um, you know, indoor commercial amusement or theater. So right now, you know, building commissioner has to find what's the most reasonable place for something like that to be located in the bylaw. And so if, if, you know, if we're thinking, okay, we need certain experiential uses downtown or we want certain things, it may be that the board and staff could look at, well, what categories do we have now in the zoning and in the use chart? And do we need to add that some or change them to allow these? Um, and along those lines, you know, what, what staff has found with Article 14 is that there haven't been a lot of complaints. And so, you know, when a restaurant comes into town, the zoning board might have now, you know, kind of their, their standard 50 conditions. And so if, if an applicant follows those, then it's approved, but it still can be kind of a complex and expensive process for an applicant. And so there's been some discussion about whether or not, you know, those conditions could just become part of, um, you know, use you know, the use table or part of zoning so that, you know, maybe instead of being a special permit, it can be a site plan review, but we have these conditions that are, has to be met, right, or referenced. And so, um, you know, those are things that, you know, staff has discussed a little bit and it could address some of these comments here. And it would just take a little bit more, you know, research and, you know, and some exploration of, okay, what, what exactly do they mean by, um, you know, it's kind of confusing or complex. And, you know, is it that if we have a standard set of conditions that are always issued, is it just easier if that's somehow part of an application process so people can see it and they understand it? Um, okay. Thanks, Nate. Um, Janet. Um, when we're done, I was, I wanted to talk maybe to Gabrielle or just about her idea for like an economic development um, person is that is this the time for that or can I? I've, I've, that's not really a zoning conversation. Okay. I think maybe you contact her directly. Um, Maria. Uh, thanks, Doug. Um, these are all really great little notes about like small shifts of how we can help the economic recovery and development in our town. You know, like the thing about um, whether we make the DRB you know, make it upfront to the people, the applicants saying, these are just recommendations. You are not required to do these or, you know, getting a new category for entertainment use or like what Nate was just talking about the application process and how to make it clearer to applicants. All these little shifts, these are gonna need to be zoning changes, right? I mean, I'm wondering how do we get all of these great ideas we are talking about into reality so that, you know, more people can do things in Amherst and, you know, be applicants and not be afraid of the process in Amherst. Because I don't want it just to be a discussion and then like, oh, right, those are great ideas. I mean, how do we implement these? How do, like, Chris, do you know, like, are, is the next step that the staff does more research and brings these up to the next town council meeting? Or like, how do we get these things we're talking about into um, reality and try to implement them? Because I think these are great points. And I think these would be, they seem like small fixes, but they're probably not. <laughs> It'd be probably like a whole long process to get these, you know, implemented. But I'm just wondering, yeah, Chris, do you know what could be real next steps for us? Do you want me to answer? Sure, Chris. So, um, so the planning department has um, 
sort of stated a list of zoning priorities that it thinks it wants to work on. We have some zoning priorities that we absolutely have to get done sooner rather than later, but other things that are kind of in our, in our phase two. And then we know that the um, CRC and the town council are going to be coming forward with their zoning priorities. But if the members of the planning board want to send us what they think would be their zoning priorities, I think we could, you know, benefit from that because, you know, if Maria had, you know, three or five things that she picked out of this list that she thought were really great ideas that we should carry forward, we'd like to know that. And other, you know, if other planning board members want to do the same, that would be helpful to us to get our, um, you know, to refine our list of what we're going to work on. We, we kind of have a, a work plan for, you know, sometime into midsummer or maybe into late summer, but um, after that, we're going to be, you know, open to working on things. So okay. send your lists. All right. I guess the other thing we could talk about is whether the zoning subcommittee would want to reconvene and generate zoning you know proposals of its own uh janet so um i have a when I, I nothing excites me more than a checklist and i've i've kind of wondered sometimes like when we have the permit application it's very general and people fill it out with almost no useful information and i wonder if those um, permit applications could be more specific and include a checklist. So it'd be permit application to open a restaurant. And, you know, if the ZBA is always looking at 50 things or putting 50 conditions, maybe the application itself could set, could present questions or, you know, lay out, here's the information we're going to want to know. And even if the ZBA is no longer handling those applications, and the building commissioner is, it still seems super useful to me that your permit application, if it's for you know, a horse farm, should look different maybe than a restaurant versus you know, a professional building and a way of cluing people you know, and tying that into sort of the different um, bylaw requ requirements or site plan review or special permit. So that your checklist is actually helping organize you. Because I feel like way back, um, when I first got on the board, we had some applications where it seemed to me like the information being coming at us could have been better presented. And every meeting was kind of like, oh, you know, we, we didn't have the information we asked the last time, or we were kept on asking for more stuff that maybe we knew we needed, but they didn't know. And those applicants also didn't have attorneys. So I wonder if the application process itself could help create some order and kind of give the applicants an S a heads up of what's what what they need to provide us to move it all, you know, and get more organized on their side or more of a clue, a, a heads up at what's you know we're going to be interested in. Okay, so so more more tailored applications for specific use types. All right, um, Pam, I think you can take this off the screen. I think we're done with that. And um, unless anybody else wants to say anything more, uh, Gabrielle, thanks for joining us. And thanks for using some of your grant money to generate these comments. I think it was helpful. Glad. Thank you. All right. So the time is 944. We're at three hours and 15 minutes, roughly. Another, another short meeting so far. Um, uh, Chris, do we help? Do we want to go ahead and talk about fees for public hearings? I think we can save that for a future meeting. Okay, so we'll postpone that. Yep. Uh, old business, do we have any? No old business as far as I know. All right, and how about new business? Not, and not anticipated. No new business. Form A, A and R, subdivision. None. No. None. ZBA applications other than the one we've already looked at? No, no additionals. All right. Special permits, site plan reviews, subdivisions? Um, we have some things in the wings. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We did receive um, an application, although it hasn't been uh, reviewed and it hasn't been put in um, 
put into our system, but we did receive an application from Archipelago to build a new set of apartment style dormitories up in North Amherst on Olympia Drive. So we'll be, um, you know, bringing that to you at some point. But right now, as I said, I haven't even really scrutinized the uh, application. Of course, if anybody's interested in looking at it, they're welcome to come into the office and, um, and look at it. All right. Well, we'll wait for you to bring it to the meeting. Mm -hmm. um, Planning Board Committee and Liaison Reports. Jack, anything on PVPC? You are muted. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, nothing uh, significant. Uh, we did have a committee meeting, what, on February 24th. But uh, yeah, uh, I don't think anything uh, significant. OK, thanks. Andrew, uh, CPAC? You no, know, we haven't met. Um, but I will, I will note that uh, one of the proposals that came that was pulled off had to do with the track realignment at the high school. And I know that that, that went to the school committee last night. Um, they had expressed support to do one of the options. And, and one of the things that they uh, had in that budget proposal was re referencing CPAC funds. Um, our chair had invited the, the school to come back to the committee and represent. So maybe we'll hear back. Uh, I'm not sure yet, but um, that's the only update I have. Okay, thanks. Tom, uh, DRB. Thanks, so we met, um, I guess it was earlier this week or last week, my God, what week is it? Um, and we reviewed a, a few building projects or um, let's say uh, exterior projects. One was for Judy's, um, which will become the Amherst Oyster Bar, which had some facade treatments in terms of color change um, and lighting structures, both on the front and on the rear that were uh, approved with some notations about preserving some historical architectural features in, in their current state. Um, there's a um, quick review of a sign for uh, Amethyst, which is next to the lingerie shop, which is next to Bueno and so on on the corner um, right downtown. I think that's 40 Main Street or something like that. Um, and then there's a new cafe that is going to be opening where Bart's um, ice cream was. Um, and so we reviewed some of the signage and, and storefront signage for that. Um, um, minimal changes to the facade or anything, but the, you know, just signage tweaks. Um, so that was approved as well. Okay. Chris, uh, CRC. So the CRC is meeting tomorrow, and one of the things they're going to be talking about is the um, demolition delay or preservation of historically significant buildings. Um, it, that one came to the planning board a couple of weeks ago, and the planning board felt that it was ready to move forward. So it's actually moving forward rather quickly. Um, the CRC is taking a look at it tomorrow afternoon, and then um, it's going to be referred to um, town council for Monday, I think. So that's really quick. Okay. Um, but they, you know, I think they just want to get started on things. So, yep. All right. Um, item 13, report of the chair. I don't have anything to report tonight. Uh, Chris, report of staff. I don't have anything to report at this time, but I was serious about if anybody's interested in really diving deep into flood mapping. Um, we're happy to spend time with them looking at the maps and, you know, talking about it. Okay. That's clearly your number one priority for the it next is. Yep. six months. So yep. you'll drop everything else to make sure that happens. I will. Okay. All right. So uh, anybody have any other things off the agenda they want to talk about it here at 949? Okay. So thank you all for hanging in there. We don't seem to be able to have a really short meeting and uh, see you in uh, early April. This was a short meeting. This is like we're, we're record time. Yeah, well, good. <laughs> Let's beat our record next time. Uh, time is 9.50 and we are finishing the meeting. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night.